Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grillin' JR with the voice of wrestling, the Hall of Famer himself, underneath the black hat and all, Jim Ross. JR, how are you, man? I'm so, can't, I'm so goddamn cantankerous, Conrad. I can't stand myself anymore. After last week's show, I think it spoiled me. So, folks, if you're looking for some controversy and me to be a little bit more outspoken, maybe a little bit more aggressive in this verbal journey we're on, you got it. No problem there whatsoever. Good weekend, Conrad. Your Crimson Tide wins. My Oklahoma Sooners had a nice win at home. It's a beautiful day for football. God, I felt so blessed to be there. And uh, I wasn't bitter. And I, I can't believe somebody said, some ignorant bastard, JR, you're so bitter. I feel so sorry for you. Let me tell you something, pal. There's a lot of people in this world you should feel sorry about. And you should go out of your way to help them and not face a goddamn much attention to pro wrestling. And don't worry about old JR. I ain't bitter about nothing. I just have an opinion, and sometimes I like expressing it. And so that's just what happens to get old and stubborn and uh, headstrong and think you're right. So uh, anyway, life is good, man. I can't wait. To, this AEW stuff has been really fun. Uh, you know, I, I love when I say something about AEW that people take out of context because they've got to find something to get some clicks. You know, I said last week that I thought that sometimes some of our talents were trying too hard and they were doing too many dangerous moves. Uh, and then somehow or another got turned around to where I was knocking their work. And I don't, that's just amazing. It's amazing. So instead of going off on a tirade on that, these idiots, uh, we'll move on to what we got to talk about today. And this show today is really going to be interesting. Uh, it, it has, it was not a great show. So of course, we're just saying it was not a great show. We're talking about buried alive from October yeah. of 1996. Yeah. I should use, I'm using pronouns again. You dumb bastard. Uh, uh, but it wasn't a great, it, buried alive was not a great show. It was a kind of a glorified Monday night raw with a great main event, uh, a, a unique main event. I don't know if it's even great, uh, but it was a, it was a solid show closer in a unique atmosphere. Which goes to show us that when you put wrestlers out of a, their environment and you put them into things like ladders and hell in the cells and cages and all these gimmicks, some of them thrive in those in the environment and some suck. Before we, uh, we talk about the old show, we should talk about the new show. And since you, uh, had a case of the red ass last week and people loved it so much, I thought I'd get you on your soapbox to get started today. Um, all right. A couple of days ago, I guess it was Monday. Uh, it came out that during some sort of comic con style Q and a panel, uh, Seth Rollins was asked about Kenny Omega. And he said, quote, when Kenny's done playing in the minor leagues over there, Kenny can come work at the absolute top professional wrestling company in the world in front of the most people and make the most money and have the biggest matches, which is with me at WrestleMania. And I couldn't help but think when I saw that, boy, that's going to chap JR's ass. So what say you? You're right. It, it's, it's, I'm pissed off about it. And I, here's why I'm pissed off about it. Number one, uh, it doesn't do any favors for our business. Our business in general, any promotion 
in the, in, in the total of all the wrestling business, pro wrestling business, it's bigger than any individual. Now, I'm not inferring that Seth thinks he's bigger than the business, but by what he says, sometimes you could, you could, you could make that assessment rightly or wrongly, but it's just for a, it's not a classy thing to say, uh, for an athlete of his, uh, de- uh designation, you know, it's amazing to me. I was talking to a hall of, since this came out, I talked to two hall of fame guys off the record. Cause I'm not going to throw them on the bus. Uh, that were embarrassed about those remarks as well. It doesn't do the business any good. And one of these uh, cats even said to me, well, maybe Rollins is uh, breaking under the pressure because he's getting a lot of criticism. Uh, you know, here's the deal folks. The WWE today is a, is a whole different world than it was when guys were earning above their downside guarantee significantly based on what the live events and the pay-per-views were producing. So uh, a guy like Steve Austin might be making a million dollars a year downside guarantee, which is 19,323 uh, a week, I believe. And, uh, and, but he would make, he might have a year though, where he would make 10 million, 13 million, 9 million. So it's always over that now guys in WWE, like Rollins, I'm assuming it's kind of on a salary, uh, in, in, in broad terms. So I don't know how many houses Seth has drawn, uh, that sold out, uh, because as another hall of Famer mentioned to me, it's not about the individuals being over or drawing the house or, 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 or selling that selling out. It's about the WWE brand selling out. Hence the best illustration is WrestleMania, the brand name WrestleMania and the, and the parent company, the big dog in the yard. WWE is what sells tickets at WrestleMania, uh, under the uh, auspices that they're going to deliver a special show, uh, opponents and participants to be named. But Rollins is a, he's got, a, he's in a great spot. He's blessed. Uh, you know, maybe someday he'll be as over as his girlfriend. I don't know, oh. but nonetheless, uh, I always, I've always liked his work. He's a solid guy. He's a solid guy. But saying things like that make him look bad, and for that I feel, I feel badly. Uh, I just, I just do. Uh, so it's just a different world. A different, you can't mix all the different rules, all different the metaphors, and all apples and oranges, and all those crazy ass cliches, man. Uh, the, 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 it's a different structure. So for anybody to say, hey, look, here's the thing. I, here's the thing I find incred- uh, incredulous about this deal. One of the things. He says, well, when you're through playing in the minor leagues, ironically, Mr. Khan's got more money than Vince, but nonetheless, that's another story for another day. Uh, but, and we believe that we're on a great network in TNT and we think we have a, a chance to build a nice brand. You never heard me ever Conrad, even when we're drinking, say, we're going to kick WWE's ass. Oh no, never. It's stupid. Well, but at the same time, you know, this is. You know, if the desired effect was to get people talking a little bit and stir it up and create a fun dialogue, mission accomplished. And and I, I was feeling that last week because we had such great feedback when you had the red ass that now you can actually pick up a JR's red ass wrestling commentary shirt. And the tagline <laughs> at the bottom says, bringing you a case of red ass every Thursday, uh, pick up your shirt right now at Jim shirts.com. And by the way. That is a bit of a fantasy booking, you know, Seth Rollins and Kenny Omega, but that can be- actually happen in the new WWE 2K20 Deluxe Edition. And mm-hmm. if you get this Deluxe Edition, you get 35% in savings because you'll not only get the game, but you'll get all the originals, including the pre-order bonus pack, Bump in the Night, which features the new character, The Fiend, from Bray Wyatt. And you get the SmackDown 20th Anniversary Edition, which has all the digital content from Hulk Hogan and China and the $500 shirt version of the rock and the rock and sock connection, mankind. Plus you get the WWE 2k 20 accelerator and the WWE 2k 20, my player kickstart. But what's really cool is the 2k showcase where you get to relive the groundbreaking journey of the four horsewomen and the women's evolution from their start in NXT all the way to 2019, where the women finally headlined WrestleMania for the first time in history. That's talking about the cover superstar, Becky Lynch, of course, Charlotte Flair, Bailey, and Sasha Banks, 
They'll all describe their journey to bring women's wrestling to the forefront of WWE in their own words with exclusive live action footage. And for the first time ever in WWE 2K, you can play as both a male or a female character in my career. Actually, you don't have to choose. You can do both. You can unlock WWE legend, original characters, unique environments, and make your own way from the indies to the hall of fame. My career is fully voiced and features performances by more than 40 WWE superstars, NXT superstars, and legends. And I've been told this is the best version of my career experience yet. They've also got WWE 2K shining a spotlight on Roman Reigns and 2K Towers Roman's reign. Players will follow the big dog through his early days in the WWE, including his time as a member of the shield, plus all the great rivalries with Lesnar and Cena and Undertaker and more. And overall players compete in 16 matches and live out key chapters in Reigns impressive mark on WWE history. Lots of live action introductions from the big dog himself as well, including never before seen footage. All in all, man, this roster on WWE 2K20 is loaded with more than 180 of your favorite superstars, legends, Hall of Famers, and of course, all the great acts at NXT, plus some new characters you'll have to see to believe. You can play as the great stars of today, like Samoa Joe, Seth Rollins, Braun Strowman, or Brock Lesnar, and all the legends too, like Andre the Giant, Roddy Piper, Sting, and more. It's available now for Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and PC, but a lot of folks on the heels of this comment may be able to create a little fantasy book and create Kenny Omega in your game and see what happens when him and Seth Rollins get it on. That'd be a great match. Seriously. Hey, look, I'm very good friends with the guys at 2K. I've done a lot of work for them over the years. They're a wonderful company. Bryce Yang, uh, global marketing director, is one of my best friends. Uh, all good people. This is the game that they've been, I think, they've been building towards forever. It's really amazing how, they, how they've done. I thought, though, being the dick that I am sometimes, you got a 180 man roster. Can you imagine what a psych ward that locker room would have been? Oh my gosh. Not because of the lack of space, because of personalities out there. And you said something very astute, Conrad, as, as usual, if Omega and Rollins did have a match, it would be a great match because both of them are great workers. I've never said in this, my, I was upset at Seth because I thought his comments made him sound bad. Made him sound Bush League. Made him sound like he he was one of those guys that was, uh, you know, born on third base, woke up, and thought he hit a triple. Because it's just, it, what, for the guy that worked his way through the Indies and, and Tyler Black and Ring of Honor, who got a great hand, I don't know what's happened to some of these guys. I just believe sometimes it's internal. Sometimes they're what they're, they're driven to say, what they feel obligated to say. They say things that they think will, will gain their favor of their, their bosses. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. But for a, t- a top talent that's being blessed with great health right now, thank God, and making a ton of money and, and, and dating the hottest woman in the business, arguably by many, man, what do you got to bitch about? Are you kidding me? And you're going to say, we're, we're over there working our ass off. A lot of us have lies, but lies as long as you've been alive to this business. And we're busting our balls without knocking. I'm not knocking WWE. And, but I get, I, I just don't, I think it's a bad thing when you're knocking a company that's, that's working their ass off to be good. And we're proving that we're going to be good. We're going to be different and we're going to grow and evolve every Wednesday night on TNT at eight o'clock, seven central. So it's a, it's just frustrating, Conrad. You know, you built your business there, your mortgage business from the goddamn ground up, man. And so somebody say, Conrad, uh, that little rinky dink company is not as big as, uh, you know, chase or somebody, right? I fish you off. Well, this it's successful and you're working your ass off and, and you're a good guy and you love what you do. That's kind of where we are here. This AEW thing, young team, ever evolving, going to continue to grow, going to continue to make mistakes, going to have to tweak our styles here, there, and yon. But so what? So what? That's what growth is about and evolution. So it'll be a fun journey that we're on, but Again, my deal with Seth has done his work. Uh, all those guys are playing under different rules than the guys on the, on the old attitude roster that we put together. And guys that I talked to today, I run, not just specifically about this matter, but they, about this matter was included, uh, said it's just a whole different locker room, different world, different mindset. And some of that charm of the old school wrestler is slowly slipping away. 
And, I, and for that, I say that's a damn shame. Well, it's a shame if you missed last week. If you haven't listened to last week's episode about Taboo Tuesday, go out of your way to listen to it. There's more meat on the bone than just the name of the show. Of course, we're hinging our conversation around a major moment or a major pay per view in history, but we cover all the news and notes behind the scenes on the way da- on the way there. And there is a lot of good controversial stuff in Taboo Tuesday 2004. And I'm hoping for more of that today with Buried Alive 96. Let's talk about what's going on as we head there. Towards the end of 96, it would make the observer that there was a change at the top of WWE. Vince McMahon had been CEO of Titan Sports and Linda McMahon was president. But now the position of president has been dropped and Vince is now the chairman of the board. And Linda McMahon and Neville Meyer are co-CEOs. And Meltzer would say Meyer is a newcomer to the wrestling industry in charge of the expansion of the company and has a background in other forms of entertainment, including movies and Broadway. Although he's not exactly sure what that entails. Chat me up. This is a name that we don't hear about very often. Neville Meyer. What do you remember about Neville? Quiet guy, uh, kind of, uh, had no product knowledge, which has always been amazing to me. Simply amazing. The quest to go outside your own world is not a bad thing. The quest to go on outside your world to, to find people to make, bring into your world that have no understanding of your world is really stupid. And I think as part of that whole, <clears throat> uh, growing thing and, you know, looking down the road, big picture, global growth, all the things that Vince has done without uh, some of those people. Everybody that Vince has got under his, that he's worked with in the last, after he's made some fumbles like Neville Meyer and the other dude from, uh, Stu Snyder, well, what a joke he was, uh, God almighty. I was told one time that Stu Snyder would not ride in a limo. Uh, he would not ride in a, uh, a white limo and he would not ride with a black driver. And I found that to be appalling. And I didn't know, I don't think anybody knew about it until so one of the drivers that was there at WWE told me that. And, uh, cause it had created some low key behind the scenes embarrassment. So I go to Vince and Vince, what kind of son of a bitch you hire here? Stu Snyder don't want to ride in a white limo and he don't want to ride the black driver. What? I didn't know that. <laughs> well, somebody knew it. They hired him to do any background check. He sounds like he might be, I don't know. He might be a little bit racist. I'm saying it's not saying that it is, but it certainly would allude to the fact that he might be. So anyway, uh, there was some dandies there, but Neville was a quiet guy, kind of underspoken. Uh, he, I believe he had a real impressive resume outside in, in the world of entertainment. Uh, so I, I just don't, I wasn't over impressed with him. He wasn't a good fit. You know, he was a little bit too staid, too reserved, uh, to function well in the McMahon world. And, uh, but he was a decent guy. He's a lot better human being than Stu Snyder was. I'll tell you that. Why do you, why don't you think he, uh, was long for this world? Was it just a, a stop in the road for him? He didn't ever really envision making <clears throat> a career. It was just another notch in the resume. You think? I think at his age. At that time, what I perceived his age to be, uh, that this is kind of toward the end of the journey for him, like the last big payday. And I might be wrong on that too, but that's kind of how he approached his job. So, um, just, he, he never became a fan. One thing to get, be given a chance, come in the company without a lot of product knowledge, but once you're inside and you're getting the check you're obligated to become a fan and that's done via product knowledge. If you can't be fan, if your ego won't allow you to be a fan of your, t- your personal taste, uh, and remember that when you deposit that big man check, uh, but when you, when you, uh, if you can't figure that deal out, uh, you, you've got to become a student of the game, at least study the game. Tell me why you believe it works and what our, our fan base wants somewhere along the way. All of us in this business had to think about our fans first and our experts and our focus groups and some of the other bullshit later. Uh, the fans tell you every night your doors are open to give you market research. Just listen to them. 
Just listen to the, the diehards that pay their money to come see us. And I don't think that uh, Neville or uh, certainly Stu Snyder, Snyder loved the parties and the things like that, the social things, kind of a gadfly. But Neville, 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 Neville uh, reminded me, and I saw this the other day on TV, of Bernie Sanders. Tall guy, bald, older, wise guy, wise, wise in, 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 in intellect. But it just didn't have the the gift, Conrad. Just to, nothing excited him in what we did, because he didn't understand what we do. Let's uh, let's talk about who <clears throat> does understand what you do. The uh, September twenty third episode of Monday Night Raw in Hershey, PA, has a spot with Stone Cold Steve Austin beating Jake Roberts. When Lawler spit alcohol in Roberts' face, and then Austin used the Stone Cold Stunner. We haven't spent a ton of time talking about this, but where did you fall on this redemption version of the Jake Roberts character? And how did you feel about sort of exploiting for lack of a better word, his substance abuse as a storyline here on TV? Poor taste. It was a poor taste. Any way you can, you want to, sh- you know, uh, color it any way you want, uh, rationalize any way you want. Yeah, but yeah, but that's great. the rest of this is great for yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but God damn it. Yeah, but my ass, come on. Yeah. I don't believe this is me and I, I might be wrong too. I have been once years ago, uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> <laughs> but it can happen again sometime. You never know. Uh, I don't, I'm not a big fan of utilizing religion or politics or personal demons and things like that, uh, in a storyline, in a, in a fake, in a storyline surrounding fake fighting. Well, you guys did it a lot. Is that, is that a McMahonism or Russoism? Who's that? Yes. Oh, no, it's easy. It's easy. Conrad, who else would come up with that stupid shit? Russo came up with a lot of great ideas and he came up with some that weren't so great. That was one of them in my opinion. Uh, and if, if it had, it, 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 it was edgy. Or different, whether it was, we thought it would work or it wouldn't work, uh, Vince would usually go along with it because it was different and edgy. And it took him farther away from being recognized as a pro wrestling promoter than an entertainment uh, impresario. And that's what he wanted to be. And that's what he is today. He's a multimedia mogul. He is not a pro wrestling promoter. Let's talk about something else that happens on the show. There's a, uh, a spot here where. Uh, it's an intercontinental title match with Mero and Farouk and the referee is uh, Pat Patterson. He's going to throw Sonny out. Of course, she's managing Farouk at the time, but then she's going to come back later with a loaded purse with a brick in it. And Sonny and Sable start fighting after Sonny throws the purse in Farouk gets it, but Mero punches him, hits him with the purse and then uses the shooting star press for the pin. But the reason I mention this is the brick in the purse, because apparently Sable accidentally stiffed Sonny in the eye during their slap fight. And Sonny was supposed to beat up Sable, but Mero wouldn't go for it, which caused a little bit of heat stage, stage between Mero and Sonny. What do you remember about this infighting between the ladies way back here in the fall of 96? Yeah. Horrible. Embarrassing. Uh, it's uh, childish, unprofessional behavior. Uh, that was based on not written much of the wrestling Ackerman because it's two quasi experienced athletes, no matter their gender, uh, would have done how they were cast to do in the fiction. Here's your role. We're casting you to do this. Here's your part. You say this and they say that go over here, go over there. Now work it out, whatever. How are you going to do this thing? But here's what we want at the end of the scene. This is what we want to accomplish. And there, and there you go. But it's, it's, it is that simple folks. It really is. But egos and insecurities and, and especially men whose uh, little nuts wouldn't fit in thimbles, uh, have problems with losing sometimes because their skill set is so shitty that they can't protect themselves losing the way they work. So, uh, I just thought it was embarrassing. <clears throat> you got two players now, <clears throat> pardon me. Sable became a huge star there, uh, l- largely to online stuff, not wrestling, but her appearance, her look, her sexuality, 
uh, the way she was positioned, she became much bigger than Sonny. But Sonny was at, in the game first in, in that uh, the sexy, hot uh, valet uh, person. So that was always a point of, uh, of uh, that way in the WWE. Now, Missy Hot may say she was the first one elsewhere, and she might have been. But the bottom line is in WWE at that time, ref, uh, Sonny was the, the first starter. There was always jealousy. And that uh, I've had women tell me, come to me as a head of talent, to say, can you get us another dressing room? And then we had X number, and there's plenty of room for everybody. So why, why would I need to get you to the room? We can't stand each other. Oh, so I talked to Vince about it. I said, Vince, I think this is one that we just need to acquiesce to. Let's find another place in the building where we can, sh they can share, they can, they can lock her who they want to. I said, hell, someday in this world, it's going to be inter co co-ed co -ed anyway. They'll be dressing with the men. Uh, so what the hell, might as well get a head start. But, but seriously, uh, they just, there's jealousy there. Jealousy and, and, and unfortunate because both those women are very talented. And what they did, they both made a lot of money. Both got great notoriety. God almighty, this is 1996. We're talking about this matter now here in 2019. So just jealousy. And it'd been the same. It's the same. It was the same shit over who, whose outfit got done first by the seamstress who got the lowest cut deal, who, who could show the most cleavage without their boots falling out, who had a new pair of shoes, who's got a prettier boyfriend, same old shit. This is goddamn like being this. I felt like sometimes I was a pr principal at junior high with those, some of those folks, not good. Let's talk about, um, one of the other matches here on the show, Owen Hart and Davey boy are going to team up and they're going to beat the body Donna's. And this is their final match in this gimmick as the body Donna's. Uh, <laughs> and I think that's because, uh, Chris Candido had put in his notice, but this is also the match where Taz jumps over the rail. And of course this is, uh, not WWE's Taz. This is a time when Taz works for ECW and you're in Pennsylvania. So you're doing like a sort of worked shoot sort of deal. Two things I want to ask about. Why do you remember the body Donna's coming to an end? Is it because Chris Candido quit? And if so, was it in the hilarious fashion that Jim Cornette has described? And secondly, what can you tell us about Taz jumping the guardrail here? Well, uh, Taz jumping the guardrail was just, was just a book angle, something to create some talk. And look, you know, we had our, we've been. We've been uh, looking, we knew all the stars at ECW. I mean, gosh almighty, you know, Paul had done a good job of putting that band of outlaws together and, and, and creating a us against the world mentality and them kicking the ass in their own unique style. And Taz is one of those guys. He was one of those cornerstones. It's like the Dudleys, Rob Van Dam, Sabu, you know, dreamer, uh, Sandman, all those, those guys are stars. We did, we didn't have a place for all of them, but some of them, we certainly had we, we had high expectations that at some point sooner than later that I'd be able to sign. And Taz was one of the guys on top of that list. We thought he'd fit in real well. And he would have fit in real well if he had, he could have stayed healthy. That's not his fault. Just, just one of those deals, man. So, uh, but the other deal was, uh, uh, we had the, the jumping on the rail. What was the other one? Before we talk about the body Donna's and Candida oh, yeah. quitting, I do want to ask, cause me and you haven't talked about this, but. Uh, Taz just popped up in ECW and he did, or AEW rather, and he did commentary for dark that aired uh, a couple days ago, Tuesday night on, um, on YouTube. Right. I, I didn't, uh, I didn't know what to expect, but man, I really dug him an Excalibur. What'd you think of the pairing? Good. I like him. Uh, and like a smart move by Tony Khan, you know, I had suggested to the powers that be several weeks ago. Uh, uh, I.e., when the, when Raphael Morphy released a schedule of where the AEW is going to be traveling and doing our TVs, that uh, we're going. I saw Philly, so I said, you know, that'd be. Taz and I have been communicating. I knew he was interested in getting his toe back in the water in some shape, form, or fashion. I'm, I'm a fan of his work. He's a friend of mine. Uh, you know, we're football guys and all that good stuff. So, I suggested to some of our people that well, maybe a surprise thing in Philly. And of course he comes out in Philly and uh, I thought, you know, use him as a, as a, uh, second or a manager or a referee or not a, or whatever, some find a role, uh, you know, and, uh, he was, uh, when, when I think it was Cody, Cody and, and, uh, Tony Khan decided to use him on commentary with Excalibur, which freed up Shivani and me, which did not hurt my feelings at all. <laughs> 
Well, here's the deal. It's not about being lazy. Uh, you know, I, you know, I, and I, you give everything you got Conrad, whether some believe it or not, it's an and adrenaline dump for two hours. And then you got to yeah, start all over again. Yeah. And, and when you're done, it's kind of like the crescendo. Uh, it's, in other words, it's like, you, you, it's like having great sex and you get to, and you get to where you want to go all along. And now it's just time to have a smoke. And so for me, after sitting out there two hours ch and change, uh, and we're done, it's kind of time for me to go have a smoke and I don't even smoke anymore. But, you know, ba basically it's a Shivani and I running, which is another, should be a, a home video racing to the nearest their bathroom and pray to God. There's more than one open urinal because it, old guys sitting out there for two hours and change without peeing is daunting to say the least. So, uh, but I thought they did well, man. And I, I'm not sure, uh, how, how much that's going to happen. Uh, don't know. But I hope that Taz is back with us, uh, you know, more often than not, for sure. Yeah, I thought, uh, it, I thought nice, he did a good nice, job. Nice heart. I'd like to see, uh, I'd like to see more Taz. I didn't realize how much I missed him on commentary until I saw it again. But let's talk about Candido. The story has been out there. I think that the the click was just uh, uh, they were on him, and he was not their their favorite. And of course, we know now that uh, Sonny was having a relationship. Were rather inappropriate one at the time, probably given her status with Shawn Michaels and Candido is just sort of fed up. And supposedly he tries to quit while he's on uh tour and he's told, oh, you can't just do that. You've got to give written notice. And hmm. supposedly he goes and gets just a blank sheet of paper that says, I quit Chris Candido and, and handed it in. And I think this is the last time we would see him. And the gimmick, it's not too long before we see him pop up in ECW. What do you remember about Chris Candido and his unhappiness here in the fall of 96? Oh, I think that, uh, the click was very brutal on him. Ironically, they weren't brutal on Tom Pritchard because they knew Tom Pritchard with their ass, uh, to be honest with you, uh, and, or he, or try Chris is just not a, a fighter. I, no, but I don't, I don't believe I'm not, I'm not, uh, I have, put, I have hired the guy. So I'm not, I'm mad at him. I'm not, he's, he was fine. But I think quite honestly, the word that I got back was that some people in the clique were confiding in Vince, the, the, what was going on on the road involving Sonny. I guess they thought that might be a topic he would be, have some interest in. Don't know. And, uh, so. Vince lost a lot of respect for, for, uh, Chris, he lost a lot of respect. All of a sudden, Chris got shorter and he got heavier in Vince's eyes and he became very expendable. So, uh, that was kind of the deal. They fell out of favor. And, and the other thing that they, they just, they weren't given the creative and the opportunity to quote unquote, get over. And they didn't have the clout to try to make something happen so they could get themselves over. They were damned if they did and damned if they didn't. Thank God that we say Tom, because Tom still became one of our best coaches, one of the best coaches we ever had. Still one of the best coaches in the business. So, uh, but that's kind of how that went. She, Sonny was a real, uh, she was a, what's that word I'm looking for? You know, this, she was a lightning rod. She, she, she had great charisma, amazing sex appeal, big time talent and buddy. She knew it and she used it. Why do you think Vince McMahon is, um, fascinated with the whole cuckold thing? I know that's a weird thing to bring up, but you've seen what they, what they've done with Mike Bennett. And then a few weeks ago with Rusev and Lana and, but yeah, here we are in 1996 and you're saying in a real life scenario, he loses respect for Chris and that rumor and innuendo is there were other people hanging around the company at the time who had similar habits. And for whatever reason, they were handled maybe differently by Vince. What, what, what do you know about Vince and his sort of quirk if, for this? If, if Chris had been, it can't do it. had been six, two or three. It'd been a non-issue. The perception that he was too small to be here anyway, uh, even though he looked great and he and Tom are a very, very good team, really good underrated as hell because they never got a chance to shine. Uh, and they, and we put, and we had Sonny with them and they were, they, they were hot. They would look good. They were young, you know, fresh, I should say. Uh, but 
Uh, the, his Chris's stature of being what five eight, five nine, I'm guessing somewhere in that neighborhood, just uh, did him zero favors in the land of the McMahon giant. The theory of guys the bigger is better. Uh, but the other side of that is I just don't I don't know, man. It's just a that's a personality trait that I'd be afraid to even try to delve into. But God, I sure love for Doctor Phil to get a hold of it. Let's keep it moving. Let's talk about uh, some other stuff that's sort of going on behind the scenes. One of the things that we're going to talk about on the show is what happens at the end of the main event where we would see the debut of a new character who's apparently going to be a part of Paul Bear's, uh, I don't know if stable is the right word, but he's certainly going to be palling around with Paul Bear and mankind. He's called the executioner. In reality, it's Terry Gordy under a hood. His final independent date was October 26th at the ECW arena. And then he's heading into the WWF to, uh, be a masked wrestler. That Gordy hire we've touched on before Mm -hmm. you've talked about how it was really a favor to Michael PSAs, but he came in with a big resume. I mean, people remember what a great performer he was here. Who's one of the best, one of the best. Tell me about the idea behind the execution or concept when you had it in mind, or did it become a necessity once you realized, well, he's not exactly what we remember. Uh, well, he- here's how I looked at, remember this situation. This is many years ago, uh, bringing Terry Gordy in at that time, understanding the baggage that he was going to bring with him. Uh, was not a popular hire within the uh, hierarchy of, of creative. Uh, the fact that we needed an opponent uh, is the same old thing, man. If you don't build heels, you can't have a star baby face as your champion. Uh, and we, under, and our, we have a seven foot baby face who's 300 pounds, takes a special heel. Either size or an amazing skill level. For example, a guy like Pat Patterson could have a great match with the Undertaker in his heyday. Pat's heyday, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, and because Pat knew how to work. If you're not going to be a great worker like that, know how to work with a guy that much bigger than you, and you be the antagonist, then you're you're in trouble. But or you got to get somebody that's big and imposing. It looks like they can you can sell for them easier. And, and Bam Bam was, you know, six, three, six, four guy, 300 pounds, but he had no value because Hayes is still on TV. Son, then he had no value as a free bird. We weren't even using Michael Hayes as a free bird. Vince didn't like the free birds. They're too wrestling. They're too Southern. Everything he was about as a young man, they were, and he didn't like it. So, uh, it was a favor to Terry Gordy and his family. The, the contribution he had made the business. Michael Hayes was a big, big time proponent, as you can imagine, as he should have been. Uh, and we, we brought him in. So my point in this Conrad is the fact that, uh, I don't think he, Terry was ever a popular choice in creative. That's why you asked the question, why, how did he come up with the, the executioner gimmick? Cause it was the simplest, lamest piece of shit gimmick that they could come up with a, a, a black mask called the executioner. Wow. Really? It feels very, um, WCW 1991 ish predestined to fail. Sometimes, you know, it's not a, you know, I I almost, I saw the gimmick and you see every now and then you see the flashes of Terry Gordy, that explosiveness, the great timing, the great feet. And then sometimes you did, but when you did it, it made you feel good because he's, you know, you're hopeful that he is enjoying this opportunity, this moment. Because, you know, he's lucky to be alive after what he's done to himself. Uh, but at one time I never saw a better 300 pound worker in my life when he was on than Terry Gordy ever. And that includes a lot covers a lot of ground, man. He was, he was just that exceptional baby face or heel. You believed in him. So, but he, it, those days are over. It was a favor and uh, he got, he got, he got a lame, lame character and I, I was thinking more about this. Here's what I was thinking about. I'll show you how, how, how I was in my head that time. I, I didn't think there's, there's not after I see what they're going to do with Terry and seeing Terry's limitations in person, et cetera, et cetera. There's no way in hell it's going to work. 
uh, this is, we're working on borrowed time. And, you know, Vince is big on understanding that same theory. You know, you, you cut your losses. And so we, I think we got one match of Taker, you know, uh, Taker and, and, and Gordy had something going, you know, had a match or two, whatever it was, a booking. It was okay. It got Taker a new opponent and he got him a clean win. And, but it was just not good. So well, I thought that, ter- that Terry's destiny there was predetermined by the creative that he was awarded when he, when he came in and he didn't say one word cause I don't know that he was really fully realizing what the hell's going on. He just needed, he needed to be paid. He wanted to work. And that's what, that's what, that's what this whole job for him was about. It wasn't a passionate hire. He wasn't all invested in it. He wasn't, he wasn't with the free birds anymore. And sometimes maybe to make matters more challenging, he saw Michael at every TV. And of course they were, they were free bird buddies and that's fine. They should have been. But it wasn't the same, and I felt bad for the guy. I sure did, and I was so sad when he passed away. You know, gosh almighty. I met his, his, his daughter at an indie event down in Dallas. She's wrestling son, and boy, she sure looks like him, man. Uh, Miranda Gordy, nice lady, nice young lady. And Connie Gordy, his widow, is still an old friend. And I, I really wanted to work, Conrad. You know, sometimes, you, like Vince said, you get your heart broken. It does happen. It does happen. And that one broke my heart because it just – our thoughts are good, pure. We want to help somebody. It just didn't work out. Borrowed time is the phrase you use. And if you're listening to this show and you feel like you're on borrowed time, well, how about unlimited nationwide talk and text? Every plan comes with that from Mint Mobile. And Mint Mobile makes it easy to cut your wireless bill down to just 15 bucks a month. I mean, seriously, if you're still using one of the big wireless providers in 2019, have you asked yourself what you're paying for? Between their expensive retail stores, inflated prices, and hidden fees, you're being taken advantage of because they know you'll pay. Enter Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile is going to provide the same premium network coverage you're used to, but at a fraction of the cost because everything's online. You're not paying for the silly overhead of a retail location. Instead, Mint Mobile passes that savings directly on to you. Did you hear me? They make it easy, man. 15 bucks a month. It all comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text. And with mint mobile, you'll stop paying for unlimited data. You'll never use. You get to choose. There's a few plans. You can go three, eight or 12 gigabytes of 4g LTE data and you use your own phone with any mint mobile plan and keep your same phone number and all your contacts. So what are you waiting for? Ditch your old wireless bill right now and start saving with mint mobile. To get your new plan for just 15 bucks a month and get a plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash JR. That's mintmobile.com slash JR. Cut your wireless bill to just 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash JR. I can't believe this is real. A wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and they even ship it to your door for free. Mintmobile.com slash JR. You know, Conrad, I've always thought that in, in the last several years, because we all know how vital our devices are to us. Uh, I, I, it's almost a game that I'd like to play sometimes. It's really good, like Chicago, like an O'Hare. When you're walking from one gate to the next, one terminal to the next, or you're going down a baggage claim, and you, and you encounter all these people that aren't even looking where they're going, going the other way. I have this game sometimes, if they're a male, they look a sound, somewhat sound mind or body. I stand, I step in front of them and we bump into each other. And then sometimes I cut a promo that you're not watching where you're going. You're going to hurt yourself. Uh, the, the cost of being, everybody's going to have a phone, 15 bucks. My point, you know, you're going to have a phone, you know, you need to plan. You get a great plan for $15 folks too good to be true. It, but it is true. And Conrad. Uh, is so right. This is an offer that you really need to check out. If you're going to be on your phone and you know, you are, it, it sounded too good to be true to me. I mean, I, I even checked, you know, with, uh, with mint mobile, just to make sure that I had this right, but the website is so easy and it makes total sense. You know, lots of other companies we're familiar with have been disruptors in their space and they do that by eliminating the middleman. You're not paying for a local store. You're not paying for rent and employees here locally. Instead, it just comes straight to you and you, as a result, save money and uh, man, mint mobile's got it figured out, dude, 15 bucks. How are they doing that? Mintmobile.com 
slash JR. Save yourself some money. You'll be glad you did. Let's talk about uh, Barry Windham. Barry Windham is in here in this era working as the stalker. And I've talked to uh, Bruce Pritchard a little bit about this and he just had a con- he says he just had a conversation with Barry Windham and was like, tell me about what you like to do, which you've heard before, uh, is, is a pretty common thing that would come up in a meeting about creative or character development with Vince McMahon. And when it comes out that he's a big hunter and he enjoys hunting, well, Bruce comes up with the stalker idea. They go to the woods, shoot some promos and it just fizzles. Now, a lot of that we could probably heap on Bruce, but at the same time, this is not the Barry Wyndham of 1986. Um, mm-hmm. what do you remember about the stalker character? I mean, just based on reputation and resume, you had to be excited that Barry was around, but the execution, well, feels a little less than great. Certainly at one time in Barry Wyndham's career, he was so damn good that we would have been remiss to not try to tap into that one more time, even on a short term level, we get some high quality, big time matches out of Barry Wyndham, uh, would have been amazing. We didn't get that. Uh, sometimes man, the old train leaves the station and for what, you know, he has been restless as a teenager. His body was beat to hell. Uh, but we thought, man, this guy was magical. I mean, he's like one of those NBA all-star guys. You get to your team. He might be the seventh or eighth guy, but you know that when he gets on the end of the game, he's going to score for you. But, uh, you know, Hey, look, Bruce came up with an idea that at least made it was different. Sometimes they work. Sometimes they don't. You, there's no guarantee, but the uh, Barry Wyndham of 86 could have been a star in anybody's game. It's just a matter that the father time don't do no jobs. Neither does uncle Sam, by the way, the day after in your house, mind games, is uh, like, uh, the biggest, most important Monday night battle so far, we've ran through a lot of what's going on here, but the real story is this is where you're going to introduce the, the fake razor and diesel. We got a glimpse of them the night before at the pay-per-view WCW wants to act preemptively. So they let the NWO take over the show. So they've actually got the real Scott Hall and Kevin Nash on TV early as a way to sort of counteract what you guys are doing. Um, Vince McMahon is trying to load the show up. He pulls the intercontinental title pay-per-view finale and makes it a raw special instead. And this is where we see more of the ECW bit with Taz jumping the guardrail and holding up a sign that says Sabu fears Taz. Of course, it's a miss. We've talked about this before with the razor diesel stuff. You can check it out in the archives, but they're having fun with it on the other side. Since you guys are, are debuting you know, the fake razor and diesel, they're going to introduce Mike Jones, the former Virgil from the WWF. And of course, famously Mike Jones was named Virgil because that's dusty Rhodes' real name. And they wanted a tongue in cheek inside baseball reference to the promoter or the booker rather of the opposition. So when they get to do turnabout fair play with Mike Jones on WCW, they name him Vincent, like, you know, Vince McMahon. (laughs) <laughs> the ratings come in and, uh, this tells the story. Nitro does a 3.4 raw does a 2.0. They kick our ass, man. That's what they're doing. And they're giving, they're providing a product. The fans are interested in seeing that simple folks. We weren't. It's uh it's a fascinating time in the business because Vince is sort of scrambling to figure out, Hey, what can, you know, we'll try anything. So he's doing cross promoting with ECW, which had not it's not normal for him. And yeah, he's bringing in old talent like Terry Gordy, just to see what we can do and repackaging Barry Wyndham. And Hey, let's, let's get the fake razor and diesel out there. He's pulling out all the stops he can. And it just doesn't all, seem all cheap fixes, right? All cheap fixes. Uh, I don't think it costs us a lot to hire Barry or, uh, uh, anybody else, quite frankly, though, you know, Gordy. Terry, Barry, all they, they weren't high dollar guys. And we here we were trying this is one of my pitches about the talent relations job. Experiences like we're talking about right here on this show today is what helped me probably led me to the talent relations job as much as anything. Because my spiel to Vince was we cannot continue to recycle. We cannot continue to repackage. 
And uh, that's what we were doing. And, and look at, you know, it's like a, trying to make Davy Boy a tag team wrestler because he was a great tag team wrestler with, uh, with the, with the, with dynamite, right? Great British Bulldogs are great. There was one British Bulldogs. And now then now, of course he's got to be named the British Bulldog. We got to put Davy. He's a very talented guy. Could have been a huge star, bigger star in the UK. If he had been a single, but we had to put him back in a tag because that's what we had done before. Well, we've always done it this way. And that's a kiss of death and, and creativity uh, of any ilk, especially in pro wrestling where fans think they're seeing the same thing and you're not trying hard creative. You're not trying hard. You're recycling your shit now. And I don't like it. Give me something new. Even if it's bad, let me decide if it's bad or not, but try things new. And that's kind of where we were at right then Conrad trying new things, but nobody was, was saying, okay, man, it's going to be a great Christmas bonus time because we just made Terry Gordon, the executioner that didn't happen. Well, let's talk about what we're doing at the live gate. Um, we should mention that the WWF lost television syndication in the New York market and they had had uh, a very expensive, costly deal where they were paying weekly to be there and they're going to lose that. And at the same time, they've also decided to run Madison square garden with, well, an interesting roster. The card is going to be filled with 10 matches and there are lots of great talent on there. And lots of chant, lots of talented performers, but maybe not the biggest names. Sal sincere, Alex Porto, Bob Holly, Justin Bradshaw, Teal Hopper, and Freddie Joe Floyd. None of which are bad performers on their own, but in New York city, where you have all these different entertainment options, maybe it's not the most ideal lineup. According to the WWF, they run the show on September 29th and draw 3,917 fans to Madison square garden. The gates 146 grand, which is probably less than what the rent on the building was. And Meltzer would say that he doesn't believe those figures because that would be a really high average at $37 a ticket, but he still thinks it's going to be closer to 5,500 fans, but he can't remember there being a time going back to the 1950s where the WWF ran a show in Madison square garden with less than 6,500 fans. So this has to be a panic button type moment. What do you remember about this really low house at MSG and did that sort of send off Vince's uh, spidey sense or was he not worried about it because he knows he's coming back for survivor series and perhaps fans are choosing survivor series over the house show. No, he's worried about it. He was worried about it. We were all worried about it. The garden holds a special place more than most fans can relate to as it relates to the McMahon family. Uh, you know, uh, Jess McMahon, this is father's father, uh, was, you know, he was a patriarch of that whole sports scene in New York city are all surrounding around the old garden and every garden. I mean, man has been a, a firm component of every incarnation of the Madison square garden that's ever been. So, uh, yeah, it's important. Do you think that when, uh, they, they had to bring in stone cold to sell out of Monday night raw in the garden. And then the next night they tried to load it up again and it didn't sell out either there. And normally there's this the TVs like survivor series. You're going to talk about here in a minute or whatever, especially a raw or any of those TVs always usually did very well. But, uh, you know, so I, I, we, we, we knew man, then we got to do something. We got to change some faces. And again, that might've been along those lines. We, I used to do the same example of Vince. I said, God damn it, Vince. We got to quit. We got to stop repackaging the bulldog because it's, we're not, help, we're not helping Davey or any other talent that we're repackaging in that respect. Uh, let's give them new things. Let's expand on their ex- existing characters. Let's re let's repolish what they got. There's a lot of things we could do that is blowing it up, starting all over and thinking that fans will forget who they were. Makes no sense. And sometimes uh, Vince did those things. I think because I don't know how much he enjoyed then, or as far as I know how he does now, he doesn't enjoy it at all. I don't think being a wrestling guy, he's the entertainment guy. And Hey, look, he's become a billionaire. He's made tons of money on, big, with his philosophy. So for any of us, ham and eggers like me to say, it's not the right way to go is would be erroneous uh, and, and BS. 
just do the math. It's worked pretty damn good for him. But for wrestling purists and guys that really love pro wrestling, that's not what you're going to get in WWE. You're not going to get pro wrestling in WWE. And they'll say, you, and they'll probably say, you're goddamn right. You're not JR. We're going to, we're in the entertainment business. And that's cool. That's what they do. I work for a company now that's a pro wrestling company. And I like that too. Let's talk about, um, something going on, uh, on this card at, uh, the pay-per-view. Of course, we're talking about buried alive. Sid and Vader with the winner going on. It sucked to f- Jesus Christ to Conrad. face Shawn Michaels. Uh, Meltzer would say there are a lot of different ways this can go. Supposedly Vader has been promised the title soon. Although those kind of promises in wrestling historically, never, nothing that never happened. That, happened. that never happened. Never happened. Well, he, he was never promised the title. Sh- shit. No, he, when I brought Leon in, Leon was never promised a title. Leon was promised an opportunity to work in the main events. And that's what he wanted. So he had runs of Shawn Michaels and Sean, of course, had some issues with Leon. You know, Leon sometimes would forget to wash his gear and leave it in his bag for over the weekend. Then time he got back to TV, he was going to hook up with Sean. It, it could get a little bit uh, stanky, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, so, uh, Leon had some, some issues we had to deal with and he's getting older and he's his football body, his wrestling body from all Japan and, and the Japan scene was breaking down. I love Leon. I, I would hire Leon again at 10 times over, but we never promised him the starting job. We never promised him even the MVP of the Super Bowl. We promised him that he would work on top and we'll see how things go, which means if you get over, we're not stupid. We'll use you as you, as much as you get over, but we can't predict that right now, but we are going to give the chance to work in the main event. So never the champion situation. He was too old. Uh, he had too many injuries and we, we knew that he could not withstand the schedule that it would require of the champion in that era to fulfill. Let me ask the rumor in innuendo was that the original plan was, uh, they go to a DQ at SummerSlam. There's lots of interference with Jim Cornette. So then they're going to come back and they're going to do a match at survivor series. And that would be where Vader would win. And then, you know, they would have one title defense in December, uh, right in your house, it's time. And then the homecoming would be. Uh, where our baby face would go over in the rubber match. Shawn Michaels would win back at Royal rumble 97. As it goes, um, the Vader thing doesn't work out. Sean's upset about the match at SummerSlam. This is all according to rumor and innuendo mm-hmm. and Vader's out Sid's in. So in a weird sense, you know, you've got a pay-per-view named after Vader in December in your house. It's time, but he's not the champ. Sid is because well. Plans change. Is that yeah, the way do. you remember it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the and the media, the PR for the uh, marketing for the uh, it's time was already out there. So you know, so much of that. I've never been a big fan of playing your hand like that. Uh, I think it takes some of the edge off. I think wrestling fans, even though they know that it's showbiz and predetermined things are predetermined by and large, that uh, they still like to be surprised uh, when you can when it's logical. Surprise for surprise sake is lazy ass booking, but, uh, to give me a legitimate surprise that is organic and makes sense in the big picture is, uh, magic sometimes. So, and fans still, I still like it. Hell, I, you know, I told some of this when I think I told you, I told on our show here, Conrad, that when John Moxley showed up in, uh, in Vegas, I had no idea he was on the card. He, he, I didn't see him all day and I didn't, I was so busy getting ready for the show. I didn't ask anybody. I didn't ask Cody, what's the booking? Who's going to go over? Uh, what's who's running in None of that stuff. Nothing. I didn't need to know. I don't need to know any of that information. So he was, uh, that, that's kind of how that deal was. I, I, but I, I, I thought, you know, Sid, I don't, I'm not so sure that if, if Lee, if we not book Leon with Sean early, Sean got tired of working with Leon. Le, hey, look, Sean was a 200 pound guy. Leon was every bit of north of 300 and heavy handed and big arms and big fists. And uh, the normal thing for him, a big clubbing blow across the, the chest or a clothesline or a, or a hammer shot to the back. Wasn't like the average guy and Leon could not work soft or work finesse. Leon was a bull and he laid his shit in and some guys liked it and some guys didn't. 
But I think Sean, the cumulative effect of Leon's heavy handedness, uh, his, sometimes his gear, be honest with you, uh, was more than Sean could handle in his current mindset. Could he, if they were selling out everywhere and having five star matches, could he have handled it? Shit. Yeah, he could have handled it, but it wasn't that way. And of course he also had people in his ear that this is not the best thing for you. It's going to, he's going to kill you it's too big, too much, blah, blah, blah. So a lot of backstage jealousy, uh, bullshit. That you hope is, that you hope in their in their company is not an issue as much as it used to be, but all the little groups, little factions have their little. It's all this. If ever was a company built in wrestling on where who, where you were on what side of the aisle you're on, and how important that might be in your future, it's WWE. Being on the right side of the aisle is everything. Well, some guys who are not on the right side of the aisle find themselves fired in his first major act as co-CEO. Neville Meyer let go of five VPs, uh, the senior vice president of worldwide properties. I'm going to butcher this name. Osbert de Ars. Osbert de Arce. Uh, Lee Barstow, who is the vice president of new media, who headed the AOL division, Chris Burt, who was the head of merchandising and Ed DeLong, who was the head of international licensing last, but certainly not least. Bob Mitchell, who was the VP of publications and who worked with Barstow during the, uh, AOL division, lots of firings here. Meltzer would say Barstow and Mitchell were both involved in the AOL censorship fiasco a few weeks back. The belief internally is that Meyer wants to restructure those divisions and bring in his own people. Although when Meyer was first hired, the word from former company employees was to expect some front office people to get the ax as he'd been basically hired to do the dirty work. Anyway, and all those positions are expected to be filled shortly while the JJ Dillon position isn't going to be filled. Dillon's duties will be divvied up between Linda McMahon handling the contract negotiations with talent, Jerry Briscoe and Jim Ross working as office liaisons with the talent and Ross handling personal appearances and Bruce Pritchard handling the rest of talent coordination. Of course, we know Bruce is not long for that job. Uh, chat me up though. He, Neville comes in hacks all these guys. What are your memories of any of these names? Oh, uh, I remember Osvair was a slick guy. Good looking guy. Looked like a male model. Uh, he was high on the list of, uh, the, uh, head of HR at that time, Lisa Wolf, where well, she was a dandy and, uh, uh, Osvair had lots of dinners in New York city. Osvair was always the client. So I said one time to Vince, or I was laughing. He's, I said, what's Osbear do Vince? And he started to try to tell me, he could give me a great illustration. He gave me the, the, the working, the working title. Right. I said, you know what I'd be interested to see? What's that Jr. Cause I was always fucking with him. I th- I'd love to see his expense report. How much wine he has at dinner. Well, goddamn, we can do that. <laughs> so he stops what he's doing. Right. And he gets somebody call somebody. Hey, look at Osbear's expense report. <laughs> and that son of a bitch is drinking good wine, baby. I, mean, I'm talk, I, I ain't talking, I ain't talking Boone's farm here. Now I'm talking four or $500 of wine, a bottle and maybe more than one bottle. You know, of course the clients, you got to impress the clients. So you know, I said, well, the next thing I'm going to tell you is that because we're wrestling, we got to go overboard to impress the clients because you know, it's, we're the wrestling people. We're those gypsies, those carnies, uh, so, I said, well, so basically he's, he's full of shit. He was, you were high, you were high on. He, he was, like, no, well, he was, he, he was on the great PR guys. So he could shake your hand, look in the eye and you know, how great you are and all this other stuff. He was a worker, man. He was a better worker than all the boys we had in the main events. He knew how to play his gimmick and he stayed there a long time, uh, you know, for a long time. He, I'm sure he made great money because he came in again. These guys come in with these wonderful, uh, allegedly wonderful resumes. And sometimes I often wondered, well, what do the people in HR do? They, do you really do a background check? Do you find out why these son bitches are even available? If they're that great, why are they available immediately? I don't understand that. It lacks logic to me, but, uh, you know, that was, that was a, that, that whole era, I think in that mid nineties, Hey, look, I, I get that's That was in the same era, Conrad, when JJ, not too long after this time we're talking about, well, I guess JJ just left. Uh, cause he wasn't mentioned on your little spiel right there. And Linda JJ was out. Yeah. JJ quit, you know, right around the same time as, um, I think it was Shane's wedding. He did. 
Yeah. yeah my wife, Jan, God bless her, went to the wedding. And uh, our friend Bruce and I were in South Africa. And not on a safari or uh, going through the yellow pages. We were doing an outdoor show at uh, a soccer stadium. And that's when we got the word that JJ left. Bruce pitched for the job, kind of let Vince be known that he wanted a job and he'd been waiting for it a long time, blah, blah, blah. And he got it. Good for him. Yeah. Well, a quick bit of research showed some interesting uh, challenges in this relationship. In 2004, there's some court documents out there where WWE was suing him. And him. suing who? Uh, your boy, Osper. Oh, <laughs> okay. And, uh, well, it's, it is arguable that he was negligent, either in not having his mail forwarded to his home address or for failing to check his mail at the New York apartment. So there is a, a motion to sort of keep this going, but effectively, um, I think the. What did he do? I guess I'm, I'm trying not to say that he did something <laughs> that he didn't do, but the legal paperwork here looks like there was maybe some fraud involved. Might've uh, been, might've been. He was involved in if, if there, if there a big, if, if there was fraud involved, I'm sure I'm not sure. I'm assuming it came in the form of kickbacks for uh thing. There's a guy there named Jim Bell at the same time that got caught doing that deal. That's just a lack of, uh, that's just lack of attention to detail by, by everybody in the tower in that regard. These guys had their own, they were trusted. I guess you got to trust everybody, but there wasn't a proper checks and balances in place to make sure these some bitches weren't drinking $500 of wine two or three nights a week. And, uh, and so that's, I don't know what he did. I, I want to say he was involved in international syndication or somehow. International yeah. business. The, the, he, he, the official title, senior vice president of worldwide properties. Okay. By the way, um, it does make me think a little bit, hey, gosh, we probably ought to be careful. There may be a little bit of where there's smoke, there's fire. Because when you look him up on LinkedIn, uh, there's no mention of WWE at all. Surprise. Hmm. Uh, Lee Barstow, who was the VP of new media and who was heading up AOL division. Not a name. I remember. What can you tell us about Lee? Nice guy. I uh, never had a cross word with him. I was surprised to see him let go. He'd been, he, he was there when I got there in 93, but, uh, I never heard any, any negative words about Lee, but you know, again, you know, this is so ubiquitous. You know, he, everything starts and ends with him still does. He's got a great staff around him. I'm not saying that. So people take it any way they want. Well, big man's working sink by himself. No, he's not idiots. But he, but he makes sure everything funnels through him. He signs off on everything. And so sometimes it's inevitable, even there's amazing, overwhelming work ethic. And the fact that sleep is our enemy, uh, that's another nice t-shirt. Sleep is our enemy. Uh, so not mine. I can tell you that. Uh, so I, I, I just think sometimes things fell through, fell through the cracks a little bit, a little bit. And sometimes you make bad hires. I've made bad hires. Why can't McMahon make bad hires? He did. And some of them just showed up a little bit more prominently. I forgot that Osfer, uh, Osfer D'Arce, I think he was he's French or what the hell he was. He has struggled with a very strong accent. He sounded like Ricardo Montalban. So what that's worth. Well, your boy Lee Barstow, uh, he wound up at uh, A and E, but he was with you guys for like seven years. What about, uh, Ed DeLong? Does that one ring a bell? No, I remember the name. I remember the name. You got to remember, Connor, when I first got there, uh, I was so out, outside looking in, you know, I wasn't really welcome at the TV studio, uh, to any degree. Some people there made me made it very uncomfortable. Uh, and I just wrote it out. Thank God for, I just told this story before. Thank God for Monsoon and Heenan and Mean Gene. Uh, they were my guys and they, they cut the shit boy. Uh, just like Monsoon chewed, uh, uh, Lord Alfred Hayes out for what are you, why are you being such a frick? This kid, he ain't done nothing to you. He says, he's what he's paid his dues. He's a territory guy. He's old school. Alfred, he's a territory guy. And he said, well, I, I know he's going to take some work away from you. And, 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 uh, Monsoon says, I hope that he does. I hope that he does. So anyway, uh, that made peace with the uh, Lord Alfred. God bless him uh, these days. 
uh, well, thanks to gorilla, but I wasn't around those guys, Bob Mitchell, was, does that I, ring a bell? Yeah. The name rings a bell. I, I, I probably could re- resurrect a conversation I had with him somewhere along the way, but all nice guys, they're, they're, none of them stood out that Osbear is the one that, the, that would stand out like a sore thumb. Like, you know, something's up here. He's too slick. He's too cool. Everything's cut. Cu- everything is custom, you know, uh, custom made suits and slacks and shirts. He looked like a male model. I'm telling you. So maybe this fat guy's like me, well, jealous, well, jealous, jealous. I don't know, but I, he's the one that would be the, would, would have the uh, highlight on him. If you shine the light on all these guys, uh, about being let go. Cause he was, a, he was a high ticket item and I'm not so sure how productive that he was. Well, we know who's, uh, who's on their way out. Let's talk about who's on their way in. Uh, Brian James is going to be the roadie and he's going to be using the ring name, Jesse James. And, uh, they're making him do the doubles. That's J E double S double E J A double M E double S sort of ripping B- off. The yeah. Here's another way to put it. B O R I N G G G B O R I N G G poor shit. Whose idea was that to reveal that he was the real singer? I mean, obviously we know road dog's going to come on to be a big star, but this Jesse James, Hey, I was the real singer. Seems a little, eh, I think, uh, well, to be honest with you, I didn't think I was, not, that was a bad idea because I believe this is my opinion. I might be wrong. Uh, that, that road dog is a better worker than Jeff. Uh, and I thought he had more of an upside cause he was fresher. Jeff would be on TV. You know, I, I that's what I thought. I may be wrong. Anything I say about it's going to be, oh, JR is knocking Jeff. You know, I, I'm not knocking anybody. I make, I got, I got a right to my goddamn opinion folks. If not, then you should be listening to somebody else's podcast. Uh, and I know Conrad fucking cringe at that deal, but you know, come on, I'll just to be honest. No, no, I, I, thought, I got I, four other ones for him to choose from, but I'm loving this red ass Jr. So let her rip tater chip. Well, I'm, I'm just saying that road dog had, had a lot more, bigger, stronger, hell of a, as good a worker. So, uh, I just, I think Bruce had a lot to do with that whole angle and he did a, did a real good job. Bruce is mostly invested in the angle because he, he and Jeff are buddies. And the, he, Bruce liked the sizzle and the entertainment aspect of that deal. All well and good, all well and good. But I thought as a, the, or in the big picture that the best worker of the two was going to be road dog. And so how that came about and the little thing about he exposed himself to no, it's not sound good. Does it that he exposed that he was a singer, uh, was, uh, was unique. So look at, here's the thing until road dog got into DX, he was a solid, well talented skilled mid upper to mid to semi main guy. Same as Jeff mid card, to semi main guy. But when road dog got into the, into DX, he became a mega star and was making seven figures a year. I know this for a fact, uh, Jeff didn't have that thing to, to, to gravitate to. He didn't have, uh, the DX. He still had that same old gimmick that was getting older people which is, I think why he cut his deal with Russo. Uh, and uh, they went to, uh, and he went to join him in WCW as time went on. So, but I always thought that road dog was the player of those two. All right, Jim, we need to run a timeout right now and remind everybody that you and I are coming to Nashville and we're bringing Tony Schiavone with us. Yep. Supershowlive.com is where you can pick up your tickets. That's www.supershowlive.com. We're so excited to be there. We're at Zany's in Nashville right up the road from where AEW is going to be. And last week after teasing that I thought some AEW superstars may swing through, I had not one, but two, and actually maybe it was three. I need to check my phone again. Guys text me individually to say, Hey, is it cool if uh, I come by after the show in Nashville? Absolutely. So we've already got some AEW talent lined up. Now all we need to do is line you up to visit with JR and uh, Tony Schiavone and myself. It's the first live super show we've done like this. It's a late night show. We're going to be on an adrenaline rush after a great show from AEW. You will be too. The Moscow mules will be flowing. Pick up yeah, your tickets baby. right now. Supershowlive.com. What do you think we might talk about that day? Well, we'll talk about the show that we just got through doing in Nashville. Uh, we'll talk about whatever's on the fans mind. The great thing about it is our tickets are affordable. There's not a lot of folks with the venues, not that large. I've played Zanies there a couple of times. It's a great venue. I met Conrad there for the first time while I was eating some Hattie B's uh, hot chicken. Uh, had a great, great show with Jerry Lawler at one point in time. But Tony, Conrad, and JR together 
after an AEW show, folks. It's going to be a, so much damn fun. But we're going to be drinking some mules, and we're going to be taking your questions and telling you stories and just having a great time. Photo ops, autographs, sign your swag, whatever you want to do. Uh, it's going to be a fun time. And the three of us, the great thing about the three of us is why we all get along well uh, and we enjoy working with each other is the fact that we all started out as fans. We still have that in common and that inseparable bond that we wrestling fans, you listening and, uh, and us doing the show uh, is absolutely uh, unbreakable. It's special because we know how hard we've all fought to, for our own dignity and not to be fat shamed because we are a wrestling fan. Oh, you like that wrestling? I sure do. And the wrestling likes me. So we'll see you in Nashville after our show. And, and, and we'll have, we're going to have a great time. Can't, can't wait. Can't wait, Connor. It's going to be a great, I love Nashville too. Nash Vegas. Hey, maybe Dixie Carter can buy and say hello. Yeah. You never know, man. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this. We hope you pick up your tickets. Check it out right now. Supershowlive.com. You'll be glad you did. It's funny because when, um, Meltzer writes about this new gimmick, he says, sometimes I think the Barry live concept on the next pay-per-view is apropos for the entire promotion. When you see things like, uh, Jesse James, the new razor and the new diesel two guys. He's not saying that about though, are Dan Crawford and, uh, Doug furnace. They're expected to debut in November. Meltzer would say the two haven't signed contracts, but they had a meeting at Titan on September 16th and both were offered contracts. Meltzer's going to say in order for them to come in here, they're going to have to give up all Japan. And supposedly the twist is they had planned to go to WCW since that's where furnace was broken in. Well, by Kevin Sullivan. And when he was given a chance to, uh, come meet with Vince, he jumped at that chance and then they gave WCW an opportunity to meet the Titan offer, but WCW didn't do so, which is sort of fascinating to me, but they come in. It doesn't seem like it's a big hit for whatever reason, but goddamn, there were some good tag team wrestlers, were they not? Yeah, they're amazing. They're amazing. Uh, Doug, Oklahoma kid from Commerce, Oklahoma, the same hometown as Mickey Mantle. He and his brother uh, played football at the University of Tennessee for Coach Philip Fulmer. Uh, and they started. They played at NEO, Northeast Oklahoma A&M Junior College. So I, I've known, I knew of him and his brother since they were in high school. And that, that really helped me along with the recruiting, uh, evaluating their offers, opportunities, and so forth. The fact was this, in, in hindsight, if I was booking them, I would have booked them as heels, anti-American like heels or something along those lines. It's easy to understand. And I would have them with a manager. They could not cut promos to the degree or the level that the audience was used to hearing. Uh, and, but boy, they could work. They're a great team. They were, they were real. They felt good. They felt you didn't see through their shit when they covered somebody with a lateral press or something, they covered them. They laid their stuff in, they were safe, but stiff, uh, just great team, but they just didn't have it. And then they had some in injury issues, some other things that happened to them. that just, you know, precluded us from going forward with them. But I really believe that we hired them, that we'd hired one of the great tag teams in the, in the world, quite frankly. But I think we used them wrong because they, they needed a man. They needed a cornet, for example, you give them cornet, you got a different, you got a different ball game, but, uh, Cornette was never in, in the, on the right side, right? Or the, I don't know what side the Al Cornette was on. God bless him. But you know, he never got a lot of breaks in that respect because, you know, he was only respected when they needed a great idea or a finish. But other than that, he was kind of persona non grata. Let's talk a little bit about, as we head to the pay-per-view here, buried alive, the biggest thing they're talking about on TV is a feud. That's not even going to be a match on the show. It's Jim Ross versus Vince McMahon. And you're taking lots of, uh, jabs on TV at him too. Like, Hey, I wonder if, uh, McMahon's got guts enough to show up to live wire this weekend. I bet if he does, he'll wear a sleeveless shirt so he can see his biceps and triceps. But I wonder <laughs> if anybody will ask him how he got him. Oh, stiff, huh? Well, I, I, that was a, I, I can't blame that on anybody. I, like most in the wrestling business, Conrad, I got nobody to fall back on and blame it on. It was my either lack of judgment or whatever you want to say, but, uh, they said, be a heel. Yes. I'm going to be a heel. I think this is a, 
I'm not sure, you know, look, Russo and I have made peace over the years. I got no issues with Vince, not whatsoever. I'm, I hope he does well in all the social media stuff he's doing. I really do. I swear to God. I don't think he ever really liked me back in those days. I don't I think our geographical, uh, uh, situations did not, were not compatible. He sounded funny. I sounded funny. Uh, you know, he thought he knew wrestling. I thought I knew wrestling. So point being is that we didn't have the greatest relationship then. And anything I think that, that could have been done to make me miserable, uh, or to make me uncomfortable or unhappy, uh, I thought was something that was going to be explored. And it was. Let's talk a little bit about, um, some other movings and, and shaking in the business. That's not necessarily on TV. There's an interview that happens with Eric Bischoff on prodigy and believe it or not, Jerry Lawler comes up. Um, Lawler had been telling people not to buy tickets to see nitro in Memphis on October 14th. And when he's asked about this in the chat, Bischoff would say, I think Jerry Lawler exposed himself quite a bit with that little stunt. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jerry Lawler, in my opinion, is a small time going nowhere individual who was probably at the end of any kind of professional career he may have had. And he would continue. Perhaps his bitterness is showing through. Then again, Jerry Lawler owns half of a promotion that's lucky to draw 150 people to an event at a flea market. So I can understand why he'd be bitter, man. I know that we started this show with you talking about how you didn't like that. Uh, Seth Rollins was firing barbs at Kenny Omega or specifically AEW about, you know, he works in the big leagues, Mm -hmm. but damn, this is interesting stuff. When you've got two guys going back and forth, especially when you look back on Eric Bischoff and Jerry Lawler, because man, with two live mics, what fun those guys could have had. Yeah, no doubt. Two extremely talented guys, uh, the King and Eric, uh, without a doubt. And, and especially in that verbal world, no doubt about that whatsoever. Uh, I think Lawler's motivation was to make himself look good to Vince and WWE by not, by trying to downsell, uh, Nitro in Memphis. I think that, uh, Eric was being a heel and defending his brand as a shoot. So both those reactions were not totally shocking, but I think both guys probably said what they felt like their character. And that's what they were staying in character more or less, uh, would, would say to the audience, what does the, Oh, I get it. I get, I, yeah, that's what, so Bischoff's a heel and he's knocking Lawler and Lawler's look, it, it, like you said, it'd been a great debate, but I think they're both just doing their job. And, uh, cause I've never known I, that Lawler and Bischoff have had ever had any significant issues, uh, along the lines that we're talking about right now. I, I, I haven't heard that. And maybe I've missed something. I don't know. I should mention that, um, when we were talking about the attendance at that MSG show, that was so horrific. Eventually yeah. Dave would, would point out that his number was wrong. The gate number was correct, but the actual folks in the house is going to be uh, over 6,000, but still embarrassing uh, a record low for, you know, yeah. more than 40 years. It was embarrassing. Look, yeah. how can you not go to the, how can you go to the number one market in the country and do 3000 paid? It's just hideous. And I understand too. Don't think that the fact that, uh, that the losing their syndicated TV, their syndicated TV was on, it was on at channel five, which is an over the air. Of course, huge, or huge on cable channel five, a Fox station at noon, Saturdays and Sundays. Now we know all that's changed because Fox is in the football business now and so forth and so on and some wrestling business too, obviously. But when they lost both their syndicated shows that eliminated two one hour, for lack of a better term, infomercials yeah. that, that the fans could parlay and go buy tickets. So it was a big loss right there. Uh, cable wasn't what it is now. And certainly social media wasn't even close to what it is now. By the way, in this era too, it looks like we're going to be setting up a bit of an angle with, uh, Hunter Hearst Helmsley and Mr. Perfect. Melzer would write Helmsley challenged Mr. Perfect on the raw show in the commentary. And boy, does Helmsley need work on carrying his accent and believably delivering his lines through more than one sentence. <laughs> um, I never got the English thing. Uh, the, he was, 
he was browbeat into saying that he was going to be from Greenwich and a blue blood and all this other shit. Uh, I don't know that Hunter ever really wanted to do that, but he team player and did what Vince wanted. And I think, you know, and, and maybe that might've been one of the reasons that so, at, along the way that Patterson and triple H didn't ha- always see eye to eye because they're both great minds. And sometimes great minds do not think alike. And they're different eras. They have different philosophies, uh, was the fact that Pat was always laughing at, regarding the, the Hunter Hearst Helmley character. So that's when, when they, when Hunter was able to get control of his own creative, which he did, he, the Hunter Hearst Helmsley was dropped. Triple H was added and the character became more tough guy, you know, more of a, a rugged, dangerous heel kind of a per, or character, baby faced kind of a guy. So there's all of those backstories, but it's amazing. Isn't it? Fans listen to the show folks. Are, it, our business is crazy. I'm telling you it's fucking crazy. Here's guys, grown men going all ape shit and getting all worked up over something that is a fictional presentation. That's a show business presentation. And so here's what happens. If you're going to be that weak and that have that little self-esteem and that little confidence that you can't trust a creative, then you need to get your ass to someplace else where you can be comfortable because just to sit in the same place and bitch and moan about it. Ain't going to make your life any happier or your family any happier or probably make you any more money unless you like being a kept man. I was a kept man for a couple of years. I didn't work hardly any at all. And I made a lot of money. Thank you very much. Vince. I appreciate it. He knows it. I told him, but I'm not the, I, don't, I need to work. I need to work. I don't want to sit home and die. You know, I don't want to sit home and die. Going to Pittsburgh this past week was emotional for me because my little traveling partner who grew up there wasn't there. So I need to work. So when I hear guys like Rollins or somebody or some fan saying JR's phoning it in, go fuck yourself. How's that? You little bastard. Next, I'm, I'll be, in, I'm, I'm, I'm easy to find. Uh, uh, you, you, you know where I'm going to be every Wednesday night. So find me and tell me your problems and maybe you, you, you'll, you'll have a breakthrough. Maybe you can help me. I don't know. Well, listen, if you'd like to go fuck yourself, I can help you at bluechew.com. Uh, Blue Chew offers men a performance enhancement for the bedroom. And at bluechew.com, you can get the first chewables with active ingredients that are used in Viagra and Cialis. And a bluechew.com affiliated physician will work with you to find the right dosage and active ingredient that helps you best fuck yourself. Chewables can work <laughs> faster. So if you're in a hurry to fuck yourself, Blue Chew is the answer. The chewables from Blue Chew can be taken on a full or empty stomach. And the online physician console is free and it's cheaper than those other two. Of course, we're talking about Viagra and Cialis. Best of all, it only takes a few minutes to connect with a bluechew.com affiliated physician. And if you qualify, you're prescribed online very quickly. So to recap, there's no in-person doctor visit, no awkward conversation, no awkward waiting in the line at pharmacy. Instead, it's going to ship directly to your door in discreet packaging. And the chewables from bluechew.com are prescribed online by a doctor and made right here in the USA. And it's going to give you the confidence you need in bed every time you and your partner will love it. So chew it and do it. And here's a great deal for you guys. Visit bluechew.com and get your first order for free when you use our promo code JR. That's right. Just pay $5 shipping and the shipment is free. That's B L U E C H E W.com, bluechew.com, and the promo code is JR. And JR, I know you're not spending much time fucking yourself these days, but if you <laughs> wanted to, bluechew would be there for you. I got ammunition, pal. I got ammunition. Uh, I, I was telling so all my buddies are blue chew guys. Now I'm, I'm my, my, my regular redneck buddies here in Oklahoma. Uh, and, and some in my, and some in my age group are a little older and man, I tell them about, I tell, I tell them about blue chew with their significant other sitting next to them more often than not. Cause that's just what a guy I am, uh, just trying to help the cause and the women become as much interested in it as the men, which can, can be kind con- kind of uh, disconcerting for some of the guys at some, at some points, because the last thing we want to do is let anybody know that we're taking something like this because it might indicate a weakness. I say it, it uh, shows you how smart you are because it works. Uh, it works. You chew it up. It's in your system in a matter of minutes. Uh, you ain't got to worry about who you're going to bring out of the bullpen because you got your player right there with you. It's a great thing, folks. If you need it, you make, and I'm telling you that when they list the show, I know there's women in, in all the wrestling companies I've worked in the last year or two 
that are very aware of blue chew to the point to where blue chew is a part of the conversation for, uh, those that are on that uh, dating scene. It's a hell of a deal. I, I believe in it wholeheartedly. And I had, if it hadn't been for Conrad and Eric and some, uh, some of the guys on, uh, Conrad's, uh, podcast team, I probably would never have tried it, but it got such high rate ra ratings and re rave reviews. I said, the, all these some issues, I know they're all liars. All my buddies, just like me, they can't be lying about this, something this serious. And they weren't blue chew works and we can get it to you for an introductory offer. As Conrad said, $5. How the hell can you beat that? Yeah. Really? It's a deal deal. You can't beat it. Uh, actually, I guess you could go to bluechew.com and use your promo code JR. And then, <laughs> and then beat it like a government mule. You'll be oh, glad Conrad. I can only see that in real life. My God, Conrad, and those cheeks. I'm Jim Barnett and I approve this message. There you go. Uh, let's talk about uh, Vince's appearance on live wire. I've always been fascinated with live wire. I really want us to do a whole show on it one day, but Vince McMahon does appear and, um, he, he eventually gets around to discussing his feud with you. <laughs> And he says that the second time you were fired, it was for talking to the wrong people. And he used Michael PS Hayes to say, quote, stupid sheet writers. So he didn't have to say it. And you would even mention on superstars the next day, uh, that the interview that got you fired was done during a period when you weren't working for the company, but it wasn't printed until after you were rehired and then you were fired because of it. And what we're talking about is an interview you did with the pro wrestling torch. All right. You and I've never talked about that before, but tell me how that firing let's go back in time. How does that go down when he he's upset that you talked to the torch? Uh, see the, the first time, the first time I got fired in, uh, February of 92, no 94. Sorry. I've been there a year. And I got, I got uh, let go. And he said to me, the, the entirety of our conversation was, uh, Jr. or Jim at that day, Jim, I'm, I'm changing my plans. I'm changing direction. No, I'm changing directions. I'm changing my plans and you're not in them. And so that was it. So, uh, you know, that was when we'd had a little debate about, uh, Lisa Wolf was in that meeting too, by the way, the world of beast. And she, he says, uh, I said, so what, what does that mean? I said, well, you're, uh, you'll get paid this week and you're done. I said, so that fucking contract I signed don't mean nothing. Then does it? I always heard Vince, you're a man of your word. I guess that's one, another one of the rest of his big fucking lies, huh? Cause I thought I was done. I, I thought that I, I, for whatever reason I had burnt my bridge with him. We were done. I was never coming back. So what have I got to do? What's he going to do? Beat me up in front of Lisa Wool? Uh, so. That was just that time. The second time when I was off, I was out of work. I was doing some work at WSV or uh, WGST radio in Atlanta, doing some Falcon footballs and things like that. And uh, Wade Keller called me, uh, to see if I would do an interview for the torch. And you know what? I got an, I'm home. I got no, I got into work right now. So I thought give it a shot. And there weren't as nearly as many opportunities then as there are now for guys that aren't on a regular roster or working for a regular company. So I said, sure. So I did that. And I did a few things. I did deals where you asked, asked me questions and I'd send you a little cassette tape back crap like that. It's nickel and diamond it. So I did an interview with him. I didn't think it was that, that inflammatory. Quite frankly, it was a, the obligatory questions that, uh, that, uh, uh, a newsletter writer would ask, uh, it was. Pretty much the run of the mills, normal stuff, fine, no issues, but that was used in the storyline, I guess. And, but I'm sure, uh, in my case, a lot of those things were, are, uh, what they call a, uh, a ribbon on the square. He was actually shooting with me, but it's done in the context of being in showbiz. So ostensibly it could be, I could be bullshitting you, or I could be actually ribbing on the square. So I think that's how that worked out. So that was a way killer thing. Nothing. It was so, it was mundane. I mean, I don't know if people can even find it anymore. I got, I'm sure maybe in Wade's, uh, archives or someone there, you know, if you, you want to check it out, but I don't think it was overwhelmingly, uh, in, you know, fiery or anything like that. Just, you know, I talked about normal stuff that people are running now today. Today's in today's world. It'd be a piece no, of cake, Conrad. Yeah. Piece of cake. Really would. 
Well, this uh, same episode of Live Wire introduced a new character, Vic Venom, who had been doing the magazine and uh, on television. I guess he's doing what Meltzer would describe the Mark Madden, I'm a real journalist gimmick. And Meltzer would say a lot of people like the gimmick, but he thought he was getting in the way. Uh, how involved were you in Live Wire? And, and what was your feeling about putting uh, Vince Russo on TV as a television character here on Live Wire? Well, I was a producer, not the producer. I was a producer. Uh, help in that regard, continuity, or we're doing talk about it's our show, so you had to kind of have your stuff together. Uh, Vic Ben, of course, is Vince Russo, and uh, it gave it showed that Russo was gaining uh, stroke with the old man to go from uh, obscurity and no and no TV experience uh, to being on a show uh, on Saturday mornings. So, uh, which was typically back in the day, a great time for pro wrestling. So that, uh, it was just, it was awkward to be honest with you. It was awkward because, and not because of Vince as much as his lack of experience is what made it awkward. But, uh, he showed right at that point in time that he was gaining favor with VKM and, and for him, uh, that was a, a hell of a thing. And, uh, because Vince was pretty much accepting Seemingly, now I might be wrong here, folks. I might be overstating it, but seemingly most of Russo's ideas that he pitched the old man were being accepted in some form, even though some of those ideas were tweaked. This was always a, McMahon was always a great filter to Russo's outrageousness. And I've always used to kid Russo the fact that if he listened to Howard Stern on the way to work, he may come up with three booking ideas because a lot of this stuff was. That, you know, the, uh, the, uh, you know, how we've used some of Howard Stern's, uh, people a t- few times, the oddities were how it was a Howard Stern type, a spinoff, the oddities. So, uh, that's kind of where we were there. So I, 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 I worked with a lot of guys and, and over the years, obviously, but events was, a, is a, it was a little tougher fit because of the new format. We weren't doing live matches. We're answering questions. Our technical system was the shits. Uh, you know, I, it's one of those deals did, 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 did your buddy Casio down there say, okay, uh, Billy Bob's on line three, Billy Bob, you there? Hey, Billy Bob, you ignorant son of a bitch. You're on the air type deal. No, he's got a good system. It works. Yeah. We had a, we were all over the place in this thing, man. Radio WWF would had great. It should have been great. It could have been great, but another, another great idea that farted and fell. Yeah. The, the same show, man, it's just loaded. Paul Heyman calls up as Bruce from Connecticut and he starts <laughs> saying that, uh, he's ripped off all of the ideas from ECW and, uh, he screams, shut the F up. And then they cut him off. And it's just fascinating that, uh, you know, this show was as much of a miss as it was because I loved it. It was ahead of its time and something else that's going to be changing here in the company with all the other changes is. Sonny's coming off the road. Of course, if Skip isn't making house show loops anymore, she's not going to be either. She had been managing Farouk, but they're going to amicably split them up on TV. And Meltzer would be sort of critical of the old, um, Hey, we're going to put a black guy with a, uh, young white, attractive female that it feels like for whatever reason, wrestling promoters had done for decades. Yeah. Why, why was that always the go-to? Is it just because it was considered quote unquote heat in the South or anyone who maybe wasn't a fan of interracial relationships? If going back in the era that this occurred in Conrad, the mid nineties, I'm not so sure it, it wasn't heat in more places than just the South, uh, whether their closet, uh, racist, they didn't want to admit, uh, they didn't like a, a, a white woman seeing a black man. Uh, just was, there was, there was, uh, t- tension to some degree. And, uh, I, it was just one of those who tried and true worn out deals. Dick Slater brings in dark Cherney. He's a heel, a great heel, by the way. And, uh, Lyndon Newton with dark journey. And, and that was heat to, it was uncomfortable. It was almost, you don't talk about it, but you kind of infer it. So yeah, it was a, it was a challenging thing. Hey, I remember one of the funniest conversations. If you talk to Bruce sometimes, which I know you do, cause you do a podcast every Friday. I'm sure glad I'm the nice guy. Of your, your team <laughs> but for most other guys, shit and fucking guys like Bruce and Eric don't do shit for us. 
I can, can you fix that? You're the goddamn podmaster. Oh, I, Booker, come I on, can fix me. that. I will make it happen. You know what? And when we get done today, I'm going to have you cut a promo and I'll just slide it in their shows and you can motherfuck <laughs> them on their own show. If you, yeah, but because this son of a bitch won't plug what we're doing here, folks on Friday Thursdays. Uh, but uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I just, Bruce was, uh, we were talking about Bruce did something. I was going to say he did something really good, but maybe I was a figment of my imagination. Well, let's talk about how he was promoted to vice president of talent relations here on October 4th. And you're promoted to vice president of wrestling administration. When, well, you, when you get a new title, do you get a raise? Um, not them or we, we were suffering, you know, we had just come off pay decreases, right? When, when the reason JJ Dillon left was because his pay got cut drastically. Right. And he had a special needs child and he had a young family and, uh, ended up being a single dad. I mean, God dang, there's not a better guy in the business than JJ Dillon. Come on. Uh, I think the world of him, I'm looking right now on my desk here at my house of, uh, the calculator that he used to do all the payoffs. Wow. And I, and I used it too. He left it. When he left, he left a lot of shit behind. <laughs> so I kept his calculator. So I'm looking, I use it now. Uh, but I, I think that JJ, uh, the, 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 the cost of pay just ripped him and it killed him. And so we had, we had all come off of these pay cuts. I think my pay was cut like somewhere between 30 and 50 grand a year, significant money. So, uh, it was tough on everybody. It's real tough. I remember the old man saying, JR, you ain't got to believe me. If you want to leave, I'll give you a release. But if you believe this, I'm about to tell you, uh, before it's all said and done, I'm going to make it right by you. And at the end of the day, before it's all said and done, 26 years later, I'm good as gold. Let's talk about October 14th. As we march towards in your house, buried alive, uh, that episode of Monday night raw would do a 1.8 which is the lowest rating in the history of raw WCW would do a 3.2 and Meltzer would say this has to be partly due to the St. Louis, Atlanta national league baseball playoffs and the 49er Packer game, which drew a seven rating and an 18.9 Woo! football's getting a big rating. <laughs> so it's understandable. I guess that there's going to be a dip, but the lowest rating in history. Are you guys super panicked when the rating comes in for October 14th? Never got too panicked. Uh, people say, oh, you just be JR's bullshitting us. Folks, when you have a, when you get judged every seven days, uh, it's the old football axiom. You, you got to forget the bad plays and move on. You can't bring them with you. It's not good coaching. It's not good playing. Don't bring the bad shit forward. I said it many times here. I got no room in my carry on for any negative. Period. In a story. That's simple. So we we could sell we could celebrate a great rating. Okay, so for about for a few hours on Tuesday, this time go back to work, get our shit back together. But we're getting our ass beat eighty three weeks in a row, and then some of them with some humiliating defeats. You know, you you kind of feel like uh an opponent of Alabama. You're just getting killed. Let's talk so, about and, Brackus. He's getting killed in camp, and it makes the newsletter I can't believe this is real. That he already takes hate. Uh, he already hates taking bumps so bad. They've put a mattress in the ring for him to learn moves on. Yeah, that's not a great sign, is it not? No, hell no. That was another one. You knew was uh, the fate of complete was he's not going to make it. He was all jacked up. He was in, ama- looked to be amazingly enhanced, uh, and had no acumen for the business. He had no feel for the game. He looked like a million goddamn dollars. He looked, if you, it's only about selling eight by tens or looking at the abs and things of that, and they traps, all the bodybuilder shit. I worked on shoulders today. Good. Who gives a shit? I don't care. Uh, you didn't draw any money. We have too many empty seats. I'm more worried about that than your, you didn't work on, you didn't do a good back routine. Uh, he was just a great, great eight by 10 man and a very aggressive, handsome, uh, self-promoting wife. And they believe that some what that because they're, uh, I think they're German. I'm not sure. Uh, didn't understand exactly all the ways of the world. And they felt like the WWE kind of adopted their family, the two of them. And so, uh, 
it's like the dorm. It's like the office became a dorm or something. They were there all the time. So he was not a popular guy and, but everybody knew why he was hired. And it wasn't because we thought he was going to be a great star. At least I didn't. And I don't think Bruce did. A lot of guys are involved in that loop, but Vince loved him. Vince loved the bodybuilder kind of guys. And he loved him enough to hire him. Let's talk about Shawn Michaels. Meltzer would write the thinking behind Michaels, not wrestling on this pay-per-view is that he's been in the main event of every pay-per-view since WrestleMania. And they figure it's trying, it's time to try a show with someone else on top. I can get behind that, but a year later, Bret Hart's going to be in the champ and he's not in the main event of the show. He's somewhere underneath. Why is that different here for uh, Sean? If you had to guess, if I had to guess, Sean didn't want to work. I mean, he is on this card, but he's in a dark match against gold dust. It, I don't know. Maybe the creative wasn't there. It's just fascinating to me that your champion I, is not represented. I can assure you that if he, if he had wanted to be on the card as the champion in a higher position match, that that would have happened. I can also assure you that him going to Vince and saying, I don't feel it. I don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. Give me a break. Cut me loose. So this deal, uh, don't make me head on the show, et cetera, et cetera. I need a little break, breather. I need a chance to catch my breath, so to speak. Then Vince would have done that. Vince and Sean had a great relationship. Uh, and because Vince told me more than one occasion, the little son of a bitch reminds me so much of myself when I was his age, defiant, know it all. All and, that stuff and well manscaped. And if you're looking to be better manscaped, <laughs> then you got to go to manscaped because they're number one in men's below the belt grooming. And I got to tell you, JR's little motherfucker is trimmer than ever. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. JR, the rumor and innuendo out here on the street on social yeah. media is that you have figured out how to use the all new lawnmower 2.0 and you fashioned a hat over your gimmick. True or false? <laughs> well, uh, no, it's not quite true, but it's an interesting idea that I may explore in the future. Well, there you go. Man, Manscaped's a hell. Look, I told a buddy of mine the other day at the OU game Saturday in our, in our suite. I said, you know, one of my sponsors is manscaping because this person used manscape in a, in a sentence. And I said, there is such a product, you know, and I told him all about it. And he said, I'm going to get me some, I'm going to, I'm going to try that. So good to work. We, I can help you out here, but this is good stuff. So it's. It's here's the thing. It's so absurdly unique that people think we're bullshitting them. Right. They think, they think this is not a serious product. And folks, it's, it's dead serious. It's just the fact that, that men or women with testicles don't want to talk about it. Well, pretty much that's it. Let's talk about this. Like, uh, if you're a married dude or you've ever lived with a woman, you probably hate it when she uses your razor that you use on your face on her body, because it does not cut the same after Well, electric trimmers are the same way. You shouldn't dude. that's just nasty to use the same thing on your face that you're using on your balls. Don't do that. Manscaped has redesigned the electric trimmer. Their lawnmower 2.0 has proprietary skin safe technology. Now you know what that means. It means it won't nick or snag your nuts. So finally mm -hmm. manscaping accidents. Are a thing of the past. Nobody wants a bloody towel. That's not a good look. They also have the crop preserver, which is an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer. That's probably pretty popular amongst the boys. But yeah, I take, I take my time using that though. Conrad, I like to see that should be a process. That should not be a wham, bam. Thank you, ma'am. A NASCAR pit stop speed deal. Uh, the ball, uh, the ball, uh, deodorant and moisturizer. That's a process. <laughs> and I, I have, I have found ladies and gentlemen that, uh, uh, that I, I have much more success and enjoyment by getting others to do that for me. And uh, it's part of my dating process. And I have a, a prospective a date, fill out a little application, but you gotta, you gotta have a due diligence. You gotta have co complying adults. And the other thing they gotta do is they gotta rub my balls with our, uh, with, with manscape products. And they, we get to know each other better. And they understand where they're going and where they're coming from. It's a wonderful thing. Ladies and gentlemen, tell them it's a wonderful thing. And for you girls who are listening tonight, you ladies, it's both, a good, good, you. subtle, good, subtle hint for your, for your man. Let's take care of those nuts or get a little, you don't want your balls folks look like you're too, you know how those, uh, coconuts look at the grocery store. Yeah. Those long stringy ass hairs. Yeah. Good God almighty. Ladies and gentlemen, you're killing me.
Listen, ladies, both of you right now, go to manscaped.com and use our promo code JR and you're going to get 20% off plus free shipping. You're always going to use the right tools for the job. Your balls will thank you to get 20% off and free shipping with the code JR at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. When you use our promo code JR and, and by God, that is the greatest commercial in the history of the show. If we can get Jim Ross talking about having ladies put deodorant on his sack and we're going to win a lot of awards on this show. We should, we should get to know each other and you find out right away where they stand. Yeah. You'll know if she's a gamer, if she's down to play ball, pardon the you wanna, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, and I, here's another thing I think, and, and our sponsor may not like this, but they shouldn't give a shit. We're selling a lot of product for them because it works. That's why this are things we sell here. That's why we have fun doing the commercials, folks. They work. It's not a gun in our head, you know, reading copy that's boring and long and horse shit. We have fun with these things. I don't even see the copy. I use the products. I share, I, I share my experience with them. But I'm telling you, man, this, uh, I believe that for Christmas, for birthdays, for gag gifts, all kinds of things like that, that manscaping is the ex- exact thing you want to get. And then once they get them, your, your giftee from the gift her, they're going to say, well, I, I thought this was a pretty good gag, but you know, it really does work damn right. And your balls will never be happier. And folks, let me tell you, oh God, oh, anybody else as an old man here, there's nothing worse than having itchy or sore balls at any stage of life. Manscaped is your solution. I swear to goodness. And how about this? If you'll spend a little time on them, maybe somebody else will too. And on that note, let's keep it rolling. Let's go talk about the paper. You were finally here. We've talked for nearly two hours. We haven't even rang the bell yet, but it's, uh, eight, October 20th. So I guess like, uh, five days ago, uh, was the anniversary it's in your house, buried alive at market square arena in Indianapolis. This is the first WWF pay-per-view of 1996. Without the show saver himself, Shawn Michaels, in a headline role, they're still going to draw a good house. 9,649 fans are here. 8,238 of them paid a gate for 135,605 bucks. That doesn't seem like a huge gate, but it is the largest crowd and gate in the Indianapolis market since WrestleMania back in 1992. So. Uh, quite the response. Yeah, in Indianapolis, you remember, was at one time an amazing hub for pro wrestling. Wilbur Snyder, Dick, the bruiser had their office there. The Indianapolis territory, my mind, Jim Barnett had a long history with, uh, the Indianapolis territory and, and that whole uh, geographical area. So to say that it was the second best house ever was nothing to sneeze at. Uh, and what a great, I love that building. Walking to that building. I felt like I was, uh, hopeful. I was hopeful to run into Larry bird. Somebody did and they didn't like him. So. I guess you can't talk to Larry Bird. Okay, so never mind. But I, I so I'll, I'll be a Magic Johnson fan. He's better anyway. Uh, but I love, I love to seriously, I love going to Indianapolis. There's a there's a place there called. Uh, let me think of the name of it because I'm going to find it out before we go off the air because I, I it's it's the best steak place, uh, and they have the best shrimp cocktails, Conrad. Uh, and I'll think when we go to your crack staff on that before we go off the air, I'll find it out. But we're doing, we're doing AEW there, you know, on the 20th of, uh, November. Are you talking about St. Elmo? So- St. Elmo, baby. Yeah. God damn man. That, that, uh, that horseradish and that cocktail sauce, the shirt cocktail will open you, open you up. That's like McMahon said to Austin at WrestleMania 17, when Austin about to gig me that goddamn scaffold, open him up, open him up. So I get Bruce here to do that. He does it. Bit- Bruce does a better Vince than me. Uh, but yeah, that was St. Elmo's brother. I will, my fat ass on Tuesday night, the 19th of November. If you want to see Jr. not that you do, uh, come by the bar at St. Elmo's and my fat ass will be sitting there with a hat on eating shrimp cocktail and having a, having a mule come on by and say hello. Uh, have you ever had a shrimp cocktail there, Conrad? I have. Did you, did you go crazy like me? I'm going nuts here. It's legit. It's legit, baby. And Conrad, the one thing about Conrad and I, 
Two we, fat bastards like us don't food. We know where the good eating is. Come on. You're damn, you're damn right. We do. Hey, so let's Proud talk of. about this uh, show because they're continuing the Jim Ross, Vince McMahon storyline throughout the first two matches. You get a big pop coming out and then you join you. McMahon and Lawler at the announcing table. But they do this thing throughout the first several matches where your headset and mic are malfunctioning. And you're saying that it's a, a joke from McMahon. McMahon is saying, no, you're the technical advisor on the show. And, and Meltzer <laughs> would even say that you're playing a stronger heel role than in the past quote, trying to get his character more into the old fuddy duddy Oklahoma hick role as they made fun of his references to Will Rogers and being taken out to the woodshed and complaining about Sonny not wearing enough clothes. And after the second match, you storm off complaining about the headset and mic, get in the ring and do an interview, taking credit for bringing Bret Hart back. Talk to me about the decision on screen to do this. Oh, my equipment is malfunctioning situation. Uh, that was the two Vince's I'm assuming, uh, uh, Russo and uh, McMahon just create a deal, create a little twist. Uh, they weren't sure where to go with this thing. You know, here they come out, uh, allegedly a heel for bring back these two faux, uh, razor diesel guys. I cut promos in the Northeast. I do all these things that are allegedly going to get me uh, heat. It got me more over than anything I ever did. So I used to really bitch and moan about this deal because it was a lousy booking. Let's be honest about it. I was miscast. I wasn't not, I was not good in the role. People should say, Taylor, why the hell do you, you always bitch and moan, man, God, about doing these things. Hey, look, I never got, I never bitched and moaned. I got beat, get beat up by the undertaker or, or getting bloodied by Austin or Bischoff or, or the Hussein guy. I got beat up by so God coach. I mean, I, everybody beat my ass. Uh, and I never had no problem with that. I wasn't very, I didn't like it because I felt I was better utilized at the desk trying to get talent over instead of me being in the ring, my fat old ass trying to get me over. It made no sense. Wrong investment of time. So, uh, I, I just didn't like the, I thought I was miscast. I didn't think I was, we were using our time as we best we should. And so I guess the bottom line, you could cut through all the bullshit for me. I didn't think I was very good at a Conrad. And how many of us want to go on national television or global television and be in, on camera doing something that we know is not very good. And I knew that Jr. as a heel in this connotation, this presentation was not going to be good. Let's talk about, uh, a couple of replacements that have to happen on the show. Savio Vega is supposed to be in here wrestling with, uh, Steve Austin, but Vega gets hurt uh, in Puerto Rico. So he's replaced by Hunter Hearst Helmsley, which Meltzer would say was, uh, a change for the worse that the match would have been better the other way. And, uh, our old pal, Ron Simmons, who's wrestling here is Farouk is going to miss the intercontinental title match because he's out with a hamstring injury and to explain it in storyline, they do an angle on the pregame show where Farouk is bad mouthing Ahmed Johnson. Then they switch to a locker room scene where we see Ahmed holding a two by four and Farouk on the ground where we have to draw our own conclusions that he's attacked him. So Farouk will be out. Goldust will be in. Something I want to bring up though, that I don't know when we'll talk about again is a story that Mark Henry recently told, uh, I believe it was on the, uh, Steve Austin podcast. He says that, uh, somewhere along the way, Ron Simmons had some physicality with Ahmed Johnson and Ahmed, uh, gets an opportunity to work with Ron and kicks him in the liver. Uh, kicks him very hard. It lacerates Ron's liver. He's out for months. And then about a week out, Mark was riding with Teddy long and Teddy said, Hey, you know, Ron comes back next week. And I just want you to know he's going to hurt dude. He's pissed. And then of course it happened. What do you remember about there being some Ahmed Johnson, Ron Simmons for real issues? Uh, they existed and, uh, Ahmed was way, way outmatched. Uh, he was Ahmed. It's a tough deal, man. I, I see, I, I give you the opinion of, for the, those that are listening, you know, those guys are, I was the coach of that team in that regard. As if you look at the talent relations gig as a coach and some will, some won't, but from, from my 
from my perspective, that's what it was. Uh, a guy that you, you knew that if he, if he could get him past the hump with his look and his intensity and his eyes and all that stuff, he had some explosiveness to him, uh, that he could be really special, but man, oh man, he just, he trusted no one. And maybe that was because of how he was raised, his upbringing. I, I, I've heard that story said, uh, but man, oh man, it got to be unrelenting. And he got miserable. You know, at first, uh, a lot of the guys didn't want to be around him because he was so negative. And then he gravitated to the, the African-American athletes that we had. And then all of a sudden, as evidenced by the, the top African-American athlete we had that had the most respect, Ron Simmons, he, he burned his bridge there. It was a fait accompli in that respect. And so at the end of the day, you wonder sometimes if Bill Watts was right, maybe we should just name him, uh, Buck Johnson and called it a day, but boy, it was, it was challenging. He was just, he wasn't safe all the time. He was a little careless sometimes. And that was because he, I don't think he was a mean spirited guy or he wanted to hurt people. He was inexperienced. And you see that every week on people's TV. There's not one TV show. You can't see there's somebody on TV that probably in all reality don't belong on TV at this level. And, uh, but he was one of those guys that if we had had a, if WWE had a performance center at that time, or we had really a strong, uh, uh, OVWs of the world, that's where he would have been for a while, but we didn't have that. And, and because his look, his ethnicity helped him a great deal, but he was not ready for prime time. And Ron Simmons was not ready for Ahmed Johnson. This, uh, this show that we're talking about buried alive does, um, a point four buy rate. So $798,000 in pay-per-view revenue. And yeah. by the way, that's up 31% from the October 95 show. We should also mention that your average gate is up 36%. Uh, your average attendance is up 30%. So even though we've talked about business being down in certain pockets, you're trending in the right direction when it comes to, uh, dollars. Let's, let's do talk about the dark match because in this era, you were commonly doing a free for all where there's one free match on pay-per-view. I mean, you did it the month prior to this at mind games in your house, mind games, which we talked about, uh, that's actually where they set up a, a Justin Hawk, Bradshaw, Savio Vega match on the pay-per-view, but here Bradshaw is working again on free for all, but this time with Barry Windham and they go 20 minutes and it's a straight dark match. Why did you guys move away from the idea of doing a free for all match? to sell the last minute pay-per-views probably thought because we thought it wasn't working and that may be, there may be something to be said for that. I don't remember specifically, obviously if it had been working and we could prove that it had worth and it had value, you wouldn't have we stopped. Would, yeah. would have stopped, but, but that wasn't the case. So something to be said there had to go back to the old research, all that kind of stuff. But it, obviously in wrestling, if things change drastically, it's because the perception is that the old thing that they were, we were doing, or they were doing isn't working. Let's talk about the actual matches as we get going here. The first one is Steve Austin, and Hunter Hearst Helmsley. They get a ton of time, 15 minutes and 30 seconds. And it's kind of interesting because Steve is over here. He's getting a face reaction from the crowd, but he's doing this by flipping people off and swearing, which is just outstanding. It does go to show you that something that Eric Bischoff has talked about on 83 weeks. In this era of entertainment, fans were a, a lot of times looking for an anti-hero, not just in wrestling, but movies and music and things like that. Mm -hmm. This match is maybe uh, a precursor of what's to come. Uh, which of course, at this point, Steve Austin is not the biggest, most popular wrestler on the planet. He's the first match on the card and Hunter Hearst Helmsley is not even triple H yet. So we're not quite where we will be, but it is a, a great idea of what's to come. It gets the, uh, observer reader poll vote for the second best match on the card, just behind the main event. Meltzer liked it too. three and a quarter stars and the stone cold stunner finishes the job. It's sort of fun to go back and look at these shows sort of before they were stars. And obviously they're stars here, but not like they would be. Mm. What'd you think? You saw this match for the first time in a long time. Uh, just proved to me again, that our, our thoughts our premonitions about how great these two guys could be. We're on, on my, on the money, you know, uh, I, I, I got a million stories about, you know, talking to Austin off the ledge, so to speak, him being pissed off the Royal rumble at one time. And I think it was in Houston 
uh, and me going to Vince saying we got to fix this guy's contract. He said, we'll do it. We'll get back. No, we'll do it today. That deal. Uh, Triple H so much wanted to get that $1 million a year downside, not because he wasn't already making over a million a year at that time, but because it was a status symbol. He could, if he's, whether he said it to somebody else in his own intimate inner circle or just for his own edification, the fact that he was getting the biggest downside guarantee as anybody on the roster at that time, because at that time, Vince's rule was, JR, you can go up to a million dollars a year, and that's it. So I know all the monies they're talking about now. We talked about Rollins earlier, making a massive monster. He's making well north of a million dollars. Is he drawing it? Eh, probably not, but he's making it. But a lot of guys, in his, he ain't the only one that's, that's, got, that's came along at the right place at the right time that's benefiting off the Fox and the USA uh, television rights money. It sure as hell isn't off their live events. And, you know, and, I, and here's a, the pot called in the kettle black. Uh, AEW doesn't even do live events yet. We're going to, but not right. We don't do them right now. So we got no room to brag about that kind of thing. But the bottom line is, is that, uh, the, the, we've had, we, we, it's just a, it was just a, it was a unique time. And if you don't go back and research more of the time and the surroundings and the, and, and trends, it's hard for guys now to understand. It's like saying about the house while ago, about the Indianapolis house. The house sitting by itself was not impressive. But to find out the second biggest house ever in Indianapolis in a wrestling city, in a city that had WrestleMania, wasn't a bad house. Next up, we've got Owen Hart and Davey Boy Smith retaining the tag titles over the smoking guns. The match sort of is what it is. Two stars. The story in the match is... Billy's a heel interested in winning back. Sonny. He's got the hots for Bart doesn't care. Uh, Owen and Davey retain lots of in-ring talent here, but just an average match. Yeah. The, here's the thing. I said this, I missed this earlier in this podcast. We kept trying to find things for the bulldog to do because a, he was so talented. B he was British a big territory for us to cultivate and to, and to a service, uh, in all reality, bulldog should have been a single. And Owen should have been a single. They were both good enough to own their own, their own and make their own money without getting into a tag team thing and sharing that matches payoff. You can't pay, you know, you, it's hard to pay guys differently when they're regular partners. You, as a matter of fact, I've never done it. So uh, Owen was going to make exactly what Davey was going to make, uh, in a, in a, in a tag match when they're, when they're in a match together. So, but put them in singles, let them give them a chance to increase their value their wealth, uh, more money taken home to their families, et cetera, et cetera. But for some reason, uh, we had it in our head that Owen and Bulldog had to be a team. I think that was a big mistake. And, and then also, then you got a deal where you got two, you're never going to have a, you're never going to have a big program with Billy and Bart. We knew that. So why we made them adversarial was beyond me. You can't go anywhere with it. It's like the JR and Vince deal. What are we going to have a match? I said wrestling back to the goddamn, uh, Jim Londis, uh, uh, Hackenschmidt days or somebody. Good Lord. So, uh, uh cause now Vince could have a match with other guys that could work. I couldn't work a lick. I'm like a cow on ice, man. I'm closer than shit. I'm not going to do that. I can't do it. It's not my deal, but that, that was kind of the story about, about that. Day. It, it, it was bad. You really set cards, Conrad. It's bad booking. It's bad strategy. It's bad planning in fighting with teams. Having two guys that are great single stars when you needed depth. So instead of having two great matches, you got one great match because you got Bulldog and Owen in the same match. It just didn't make a lot of sense. And we weren't willing to change. And that was a, until, until we had those lousy ass houses and more embarrassing results. And we had to change. Next up, we've got Mark Merrill and gold dust. Mark Merrill is going to retain the intercontinental title 11 minutes and 38 seconds, two and three quarter stars. The finisher is a blockbuster suplex, which is the Samoan drop and then a shooting star press, which we're calling the wild thing. Uh, it's good enough for what it is. I'm not going to say it's the uh, best match either guy ever had, but very passable as a pay-per-view match. But the next one, maybe not so much. We've got Shawn Michaels out to do commentary where the winner is going to get a shot at his title. Of course, we've got Sid and Vader in here. They're going to go eight minutes. Meltzer would say Sid was awful. 
Although the match was probably better than you'd expect given their participants. And it's sort of fun to think about these guys were supposed to be the headline at Starcade 93. Of course, after the stabbing situation, Sid gets fired, flair slides in. Uh, and just a few years later, this is in the middle of the card, sort of inconsequential. It wins the worst match of the night award by far. It gets three quarters of a star. And, uh, Meltzer would say Michaels was having trouble carrying on a conversation while he was doing commentary, but he made more sense than the incoherent interview with Sid that followed. Not the best. Uh, it is a choke slam finish. It was sort of promoted once upon a time as, you know, the battle of the power bombs. And that's not what it comes down to. Cause I don't know that he could have power bomb Vader, but he definitely choke slammed him and it was not a great match. What'd you think? I agree. Not a great match. I, it just. It's just the two guys that didn't have their style, their style styles are so contradictory. It's hard to have a match of two super heavyweights, two massive guys like that. I do applaud the fact that they were convinced or told that eight minutes is going to be what they're going to get. Uh, but it was, it wasn't, it was not good. It was styles to make matches. And those guys had conflicting styles and they both were hard headed. Both are stubborn. You know, and, and for different reasons. So, but it was not good. It was just no way to slice it. Whereas it, it, it was good on paper before the match started, but it was not good in practical application of whatsoever. And now it's time for our main event. And what an interesting concept this is. There's uh, Undertaker and Mankind, of course, and Mankind has Paul Bear in his corner. They've built a dirt mound cemetery behind the mm. ringside seats on the arena floor. So it's not too far from the entrance. It's a good distance from the ring. The ring is going to be where we start. And Meltzer would say that it was worked similarly to a lot of recent ECW main events with crazy bumps and brawling. Uh, but the work itself wasn't as sloppy. And he would say undertaker took a hard chair shot to the face from mankind after no selling an earned shot from Paul bearer. And at one point they brawl back to the cemetery area. And Undertaker's thrown in the grave, but he pulls Mankind in. Mankind starts throwing dirt in his eyes. And then the Undertaker hip tosses Mankind off the dirt mound onto the floor. And DDTs him on a chair in the ring. Hits him with a chair. Leg drops him with a chair on the face. Throws him into the ring steps a few times. Finally hits the tombstone. Carries him to the cemetery. But that's when Mankind recovers, hits the mandible claw. Undertaker gets out and choke slams him into the grave. And they announce the Undertaker is the victor. Um, Meltzer would say that this is uh, sort of goofy, uh, obviously. 18 minutes and 25 seconds. Yeah, too long. As the ref is trying to stop the Undertaker from throwing dirt on top of Mankind, he throws the ref off the cemetery, like mound, the dirt mound, twice. And then finally, Terry Gordy shows up with a mask as the executioner, although he's not identified as that, and a shovel, and he hits the undertaker in the back. The shovel breaks. He pulls mankind out of the grave and puts undertaker into the grave. And then all the heels empty out. Gold dust, Justin Hawk, Bradshaw, a lot of others. They start really piling the dirt in there, and it takes a long time. Fans grow tired of this, start throwing trash into the grave. And eventually when it looks like it's all said and done, the lights go out and then lightning strikes right in front of the tombstone. There's a big puff of purple smoke and then up from underneath, just like a scene out of the movie Carrie, here comes the fist, the purple glove with tattoos underneath saying, Oh, the undertaker's not dead. And he's alive. He's alive. Connie. There you go. Vince is screaming that as we go off the air. So there's lots of, uh, as Pat Patterson might say, Gaga here. Yeah, it was. The concept of a buried alive match. Is this the stupidest view, view main event concept? Or is it up there with Punjabi prison or where do you put this? Oh, it's, it's, it's not as bad as the, the Punjabi prison. They set the record for being ignorant. I just slobber knocker goofy. Pet coon goofy. So I might say, uh, it, sometimes we fall in love in wrestling with the goddamn gimmicks. You know, I, it used to be that the hell in a cell was a valued gimmick in WWE. It was a structured, uh, match that you could have that had some name identity, some familiarity and had great, uh, a great legacy. 
after doing the disqualification finish or the non-finish, perhaps I should say, the last time WWE used it, and they're the only ones going to use a hell in a cell because I'm sure they trademarked it. Uh, it doesn't mean as much. It, because it's amazing to me that you book yourself into a scenario and then you're stupid enough. God damn it, folks. You're stupid enough to believe that the audience will not notice it's a shitty disqualification, non finish type scenario in a match that has definitively has the de- definitiveness written all over it. And is that because we booked ourselves into a corner? We don't know how to tell somebody no. We don't tell somebody they're going to lose. Uh, and is it because talents are so insecure that they don't know how to lose and still maintain some, some clout and some uh, equity? The, the, the uh, well, I know WWE has got a ton of money invested and a great kid. I love Bray Wyatt. Good kid. Oh, offensive lineman from Troy state. Uh, and a, a new, grandpa was a friend, black Jack Mulligan. Uh, but, but God almighty, man, uh, it's for, for the, to believe that you didn't beat him or he didn't go over Rollins. I don't understand that. Why wouldn't he have beat Seth Rollins? Because you're going to find out when he does that the guy that, that WWE thinks is going to be this great, massive villain, this antagonist of ethnic proportions is actually indeed what he is this very day, what he's been since he was so entertaining at the start of his, uh, those funhouse gimmicks. He's a baby face. Bray Wyatt, the, 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 whatever he is, the, the alien or whatever, the beast, the fiend, fiend. the fiend is what they call him. Fiend. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, he's a, he's a character baby face. He's not a heel. Does he retreat? Does he cheat? Does he bitch and moan? Does he do any non social redeeming qualities other than being, having a real cool mask and notice I said cool and cool doesn't necessarily mean heat. So, uh, I, I thought that those gimmicks sometimes are, we over, we fall in love with the gimmicks and we made it very challenging on that night for undertaker and Mick Foley to have a great match on a pound on a mound of dirt, very tough. It no matter how great they are, believe me, they were great, but even greatness can sometimes be lost in the dirt. Where does this come from? Did somebody, I'm not saying, I'm not saying this to be funny, but did somebody see a magic show and come up with this idea? Because there was like this expose on NBC years ago where magicians would do a buried alive stunt. And the concept is this mound is actually what that has dirt on it. There's a wooden structure underneath and the dirt or the grave is one room that fans can see and, and they can pile the dirt on, but there's also another room inside this wooden box where they can hide safely and not actually be buried alive. But it doesn't feel like something that's in the traditional wheelhouse. And I don't think that WWE would have created this out of thin air. Did Russo see a magic show or, or where do you remember this idea coming from? I think it's a Russo and McMahon idea. Probably Russo ideas to, uh, to, you know, to start the process. Um, I don't know if you saw a magic show or not. He may have, there had to be some influences there. I know the guy is creative. I'm not knocking Vince Russo. Uh, but I don't know. He had to have some influence someplace. So they very easily could come. I remember that show that special you ran. Uh, you, t- you talked about that was that ran on television about it, it basically smart everybody up to magic tricks, illusions and things of that nature. But I'm, I'm assuming that Russo saw something that gave him an idea that we can, he can modify and tweak to make it work in wrestling. The, it, the, the poster, the build, everything was exactly like Russo envisioned or McMahon envisioned. The issue is, is that the practical application of, of having a, a wrestling in that gimmick. And that surrounding did not work. And the same thing happened in the kettle, the kettle from hell deal. And I'm sure there are others. The, uh, you know, the, what's, what was it? What was her name that had the, she had the, the court, the corpse, uh, Katie oh, Vick, Katie Vick. Yeah. Jesus. What happened to her? Whatever happened to Katie Vick for God's sakes. Don't answer that. I don't want to know. Uh, but that kind of stuff, sometimes we just fall in love with those, with those gimmicks without talking to the talent. Can It's like saying. By the way, just so you know, and I know you were just naming silly shit that happened in the company. Katie Vick was after Vince Russo. Was she? 
Yeah, Vic, Vic was in 02. Russo had been gone when WCW was still around. So, well, it's still a fucking stupid idea. Oh, no, no. I'm not arguing that. I just know that for whatever reason, Russo is. Uh, I'm know. not blaming Russo for any of this shit. But hey, look, somebody had to sign off on it. Uh, we all pitched in, tried to make it work. But you find out in hindsight, ladies and gentlemen, that he's knocking this guy, he's knocking that guy. JR's bitter. I'm not fucking bitter. I'm, I'm passionate. Some things we created, and I was involved in creating some things that just didn't have any practicality and were hard to execute. This was one of those situations that was just almost impossible to execute and come out of there with a great performance because the inevitability of what was going to happen, going to happen in the two rooms under the dirt and all that stuff was pretty obvious. So, uh, well, just, here's just, the thing, like th- this couldn't have been something that the guys, I no, mean, God, no. Are you kidding? They were, Mick and Mick and Undertaker reported to work. They knew what the deal was. I'm sure McMahon had talked to both of them, especially Taker. Here's what we're going to do. Taker made it, Taker made his feelings known. Yeah, you know, you're indifferent. Uh, but uh, team players do what the place they run the place the coach calls, and that's what they did there. But it, we just we're in the right we're in the wrong formation when it comes to to describing uh, the buried alive match. It was a great promotional vehicle. It made a wonderful promo. It had sizzle, 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 but did not deliver the stake that was required. And by the way, the match was the best match on the card, but the, the concept of the, the, the match itself is a little off, but three and three quarter stars at what it is, what it gets. It wins the wrestling observer reader poll. If you're going to watch one match on this pay-per-view, cause I usually recommend that every show. I would say watch this one because it is the first buried alive and the work is good, but you got to feel bad for the guys knowing that they're going to have to wait in this dirt mound until after all the fans are cleared out before they can leave. And the only way they could have been comfortable of it under there would have been if they had a purple mattress and I've had a purple mattress for a while. If you've had a hard time falling asleep at night or staying asleep or, or, or you wake up feeling stiff in the morning, or you've got neck or back pain, or you wake up hot and sweaty. Man, you got to get a purple mattress. This thing is incredible. I'm so comfortable. It stays nice and cool at night. It's unlike anything I've ever felt before. It's not memory foam, but a couple of brothers have been developing cushioning technology for like 30 years for stuff like wheelchairs and medical beds. But then a few years ago, they created purple, the world's most scientific mattress. I've never felt anything like this material because they created it. It's brand new. It feels unique because it's both firm and soft at the same time, but it sleeps cool, which I like as a fat guy that keeps everything supported. Uh, and how about this? You know, it's a good product when they hit you with this a hundred night risk-free trial. If you're not fully satisfied, you can return your mattress for a full refund. They even have free shipping and free returns. They'll even set it up in your house and tear out your old mattress for free. And they're backed by a 10 year warranty. How can you beat this? You're going to love purple. And right now our listeners can get a free purple pillow with the purchase of a mattress. And that's in addition to the great free gifts they're offering site-wide. Just text JR to 84-888. The only way to get the free pillow is to text JR to 84-888. That's JR to 84888. Message and data rates may apply, but we love purple and you will too. Absolutely. And the other thing folks is if you know somebody that's having difficulty getting a good night's sleep. And I know it's mundane. It's not real sexy. It's not a great topic for some folks. It's not exciting enough for some folks. A great night's sleep is imperative. It's imperative. And it makes you, everything you do makes everything in your life better. If you got some sleep, you recharge those batteries. If you know somebody that's in that position right now, Conrad has told you that you get a hundred nights free. 100 nights to try the mattress. You can make a lot of decisions and, and, and figure out where the hell you are on a, on a horizontal basis in a hundred nights. How can you lose? If you know somebody, a relative, a friend, parent, sibling, whatever, that's not sleeping well, but they're too hard headed to try something new. They want to go to mattress world and see big Tom. And, you know, say $25 on something. This is a winner. And Conrad, look, Conrad's no small guy. It takes a special mattress for Conrad to get comfortable and sleep well. It sleeps cool. And like I said, I come back to the same thing every time. 
They know it's a good product. They know that it works because they're giving you a hundred nights free to check it out and make sure that you are sleeping on what you need to be sleeping on. I can't express enough how much important sleep is and how great you'll sleep on a purple mattress. We should also mention that, uh, I think a purple mattress would be cool. I mean, you could lay in your purple mattress and, uh, play the new WWE video game. You could listen to our show on using mint mobile. Uh, before you get in the bed, you could manscape, pop a blue chew, have a different, experience, do a little cardio. Yeah, man. This is, uh, this is fun. I'm sorry. I cared to wear there. When you went the blue chew and the, the, the manscaping, I got a little crazy, but never mind. I'm sorry. No, no, I don't want to calm you down. I'm excited about blue chew too. And a purple mattress. Text JR to eight, four dash eight, eight, eight right now and get your hookup. We want to thank all of our sponsors today who've supported us. And most of all, we want to thank you for listening. We've yeah. had a great time visiting today and talking about the good old days. I love 1996 WWF is very apparent here. And, uh, we've got something special for you next week. Something we haven't done in a while. We're going way back. We're going 30 years back to Halloween havoc, 1989. This is the very first Halloween havoc. It's going to go on to be the marquee event for WCW. Uh, they made me wear Kentucky Colonel's outfit. The son of the bitches. Cornette hated that show. Cornette tore his costume on purpose because he didn't ever want to see it again. He thought by tearing it up, it would disappear forever. He probably hated the idea of managing the dynamic dudes. Uh, we've got the fabulous Freebirds on here. <laughs> Tommy rich, the Cuban assassin, the Samoan SWAT team, the midnight express, Tom Zink and Mike Rotunda doom and the Steiner brothers. Damn. That's going to be hard hitting Lex Luger and Brian Pillman, the road warriors and the skyscrapers. And in your main event, golly, what a crazy match. This is Bruno San Martino is your special guest referee for a Thunderdome match. With Ric Flair and Sting on one side, the great Muda and Terry Funk on the other. We're going to get in our way back machine next week. We hope you'll join us next Thursday and every Thursday. Yeah. Conrad, I got to tell you, that was an interesting show. We're going to have a lot of fun talking about it. If you look at the star power in that, on that card, it's astonishing. Seriously. Hall of Fame level of talent. And I love talking about this stuff, which is one of the reasons I'm going to be out in, uh, at Dave and Buster's in Ontario, California. That's going to be Saturday afternoon, November the 2nd. Uh, going to be there doing a Q and a, to meet and greet, sign autographs and, and, uh, have interacting, interacting with the fans. So if you're, uh, in the area, Dave and Buster's 48, 21 mill circle in Ontario, California, uh, the inland empire toy store, uh, is bringing me in. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun there. No pressure, no fast seventh through by the line. Come out, enjoy yourself, have some fun. And, uh, we'll, would love to see you. And that's my, it's, I think it's the first time I've ever done a Q and a in California, as a matter of fact. So, uh, it'll be the start of many, I'm sure Conrad, before you and I are done. Absolutely. And we're looking forward to not being done next Thursday. Check it out. Halloween havoc, 1989. And, uh, we'll see you next week right here on grill and Jr. with the voice of wrestling, Jim Ross. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30 year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money, it's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.